Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Ørsted's Capital Markets Day 2023. My name is Rasmus Harvey, and I'm the head of the Investor Relations team. We are very pleased to have you all with us here at the Science Museum and uh, all you joining us on the web stream. Safety is an integrated part at everything we do at Ørsted. That applies to everywhere we are, so it also applies here today. So before I will let Mass enter the stage, I will do a safety briefing. There are no alarms or drills planned for the duration of our event. So if the alarm sounds, please don't use the lift, but follow the security personnel who will guide you down the staircase and into the muster points, which are found outside the group entrance. Um, the fire exits are labeled to your left, my right. Throughout the day, we will host six presentations and we will show you three different videos. And the total program is scheduled for around four hours. At around 11.30, we will have a coffee break, which will take place downstairs. Uh, and the final hour is reserved for a Q&A. And after the Q&A session, everyone at the Science Museum is invited for lunch and networking downstairs. So thank you, all of you, for coming and for joining us. And I hope you will enjoy the program. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you in the room, also to all of you joining us online. It is fantastic that you're with us and we are happy that you're going to spend the next four hours with us. We live in an industry which is extremely attractive, important and enjoys a huge support from, uh, from everybody uh, in the, sorry about that. We good? Sorry about that. We live in an industry which enjoys huge support, is hugely attractive, and is extremely important. And we are convinced as a company that we can create growth, that we can drive significant value creation, and that not least that we can continue to shape that industry in a direction where it becomes even more scalable. And we are extremely happy in my team to tell you about this in this very venue in the Science Museum because this is where lots of children around the world, young people, are indeed coming every year to learn about creativity, ingenuity and innovation. And that's exactly some of the traits that we deploy when we drive towards becoming the world's green energy major. And we will spend the next hours telling you about just that. And without further ado, let us uh, dive into the program, unless I need some help with technicalities. <laughs> Not better, is it? It is better. Very good. But without further ado, we will uh, we'll take a look at the broader uh, world that we live in. And the executive summary is we are not on the path that we need to be to going towards a net zero world by 2050. We are not on the path to one and a half degree scenario. 
Another fact which is undisputed is that the energy sector, so the production and consumption of energy as the very, very centerpiece of whether we will succeed to create a livable planet or not. And if we don't, not to spell doom and gloom, but fact is that both human beings, our nature and our planet will suffer unrepairable consequences for millions, if not billions. And at the same time, even if you're against all expectations, would not care at all about some of those devastating consequences. Even the economic consequences of inaction would be terrible. But the great news is we have that action and we have the opportunity to, to do something about that as an industry, as humanity, but also for us as a company. We can influence that direction of travel. And if we look at the vision that we have, that we launched already many years ago, that is a world that runs entirely in green energy. And you will notice, as I'm sure, this is not a vision about Orsted. This is not about vision about us as a company. This is a vision about a world that we are a contributor or a catalyst for change becomes possible. It may seem inconceivable, it may seem extremely difficult, but we are firm believers it is indeed possible. And we are in an industry right now, in renewable energy, which is undergoing fundamental change, even in recent times. And what I'll share with you is that most of those challenges and changes are actually to the benefit of a company like Orsted. And if you look at it, the, just the recent very tragic events with, a, with a, a war on the European continent and many other events and the following energy crisis, now means that, we, that uh, renewable energy rollout is no longer just about climate policy. It is also very much about affordability and energy security. And that means that the political support, essentially both from regu regulators, but from everybody in society, is bigger than it ever has been. And that is materializing into tangible support schemes like the Inflation Reduction Act, like the Net Zero Industrial Act in Europe, and many other things around the world. We are seeing some dramatic developments, both in terms of cost of capital, but also in capex inflation, which leads to an unavoidable increase in levelized cost of electricity. As we will share with you in the rest of this program, that also means that the preparedness of customers and states to pay more for that entity is definitely also there. And in that sense, it's a manageable consequence. But what are some of the underlying things that are good about the increasing LCUEs that that needs to happen? Because I'm sure you're, that all of you are aware of, we don't have a healthy and scalable supply chain today. But with increasing LCUEs, with the inflation that may seem like a big challenge right now, we are also creating a healthy and scalable industry which will have the financial performance and the capitalization to scale to what needs to get done in the coming years. We are also seeing that the society around us is continuing the journey of electrification. And even in the hard to electrify sectors, such as shipping, steel, and others, we are also seeing that the real tangible demand signals for mole renewable molecule-based uh, solutions, as my colleague Olivia will talk about, is increasing extremely steeply, coming from virtually almost nothing. And last but not least, some of the other dramatic developments happening in our industry, which we also see as a good thing, is that some of the necessary complexity that we are seeing, with such as systems integration and also protecting nature, or biodiversity as we roll out renewable energy, are adding a level of complexity which plays to the strengths of an experienced and capable player like ourselves. So even those, those start, uh, developments are indeed dramatic and profound, not least over the last 12 months. We are in a position where we think by far the majority of these plays to the strengths and create, will create an even greater opportunity set for a company like Orsted. And that also means in totality that the growth that we're looking at is even bigger than what we told you about in the Capital Markets Day a couple of years back. The little numbers that we have in the, in the light blue boxes are behind me shows what we estimated both for offshore, onshore, and uh, not, for, not for power tracks because that number has grown so much. But essentially, now we're looking at six times the current size of installed capacity in just seven years in offshore. We are looking at, just with the expectations compared to two years, a doubling a further doubling of onshore capacity, not least driven by very profound initiatives like the our Inflation Reduction Act, which of course means that the thrust we have behind rolling out uh, renewable energy is even bigger. And the opportunity set we have here is massive. 
and speak to a company which majority of our business is still offshore. Just looking at the North Sea declaration that recently happened with the countries around the North Sea, that alone is an ambition of 120 gigawatts by 2030. That's a huge, huge opportunity set for a company like Orsted. And of course, we won't do that alone, but being able to get a fair share of highly value creating products is something we think is more possible than ever before. We are also looking at coming from a position where we have delivered on what we have promised at our last capital markets day. And if you look at capacity growth, we actually have an offshore, we've delivered an, an, in, an, an increase in the water capacity of over seven and a half gigawatts, including the world's to be largest offshore wind farm, Hornsea 3. We have also continued our very successful farm down model with a net sell down of 2.2 gigawatts of capacity with a continued approximately or even above 100% net person value retention. And although that might seem small, we also think it's pretty groundbreaking that we managed to take one of the very few final investment decisions in power to x with what we firmly believe is one of Europe's, if not the world's, largest e-methanol facility, albeit only with 70 megawatts. But right now in power to x there's a lot, much a lot more talk than action, and we believe in action much more than talk. That has led us to a position which we also expected as an absolutely undisputed number one in offshore wind. As a matter of fact, our total portfolio, if you look at what is in operation, what is under construction and what is awarded, is more than twice as big as number two, a position that is not weakened since our last capital markets day, despite the massive industrial growth. We are also seeing that our, our journey to become a very significant regional player in onshore is continuing. And we are seeing that what we had ambition to be, namely a market shaper in power to x is indeed also happening. And very importantly, not least for the audience that we have today, we are also on track on the, on the targets that we set out financially. We are on track to deliver the approximately 50 gigawatts we set, but also uh, an, a meaningful over delivery on the earnings growth, so the EBDA growth annual, which is now an estimated 15% compared to the around 12% that we targeted. And this is a comparable period, so up to 2027. And likewise, for return on capital employed, where we targeted 11 to 12%, right now we are looking at approximately 15%. So what those inflationary effects and the power price developments have done is that despite some of the cost increases we are seeing, we are seeing a very meaningful uplift in revenue and therefore also in the earnings. And we are also, very importantly, on track, despite the events where we were ordered to, to keep our last coal-fired power plant alive for an additional year, we are also on track to deliver on our scope one and two net zero ambition by 2025, which is the most ambitious target of any decent-sized utility in the world. And we are looking to create value in every single dimension of our portfolio. If you look at our portfolio in total in these four buckets, if you start on the left behind me, that is our operational portfolio. And that is where, that's a key driver, obviously, of value creation in, that I just talked about with the meaningful overperformance. That is where inflation indexing, that is where higher PPA prices and higher power prices are driven higher revenue and therefore a significant additional earnings than what we had expected. But also in the under construction portfolio where we have approximately five gigawatts, that is where that entire portfolio is comfortably within our guided range of 150 to 300 basis points spread to WAC with an unlevered fully loaded uh, uh, base, uh, IRR, life cycle IRR. And this is something that is extremely important to us that you as our investors can trust that we take a final investment decision. We are creating value. The awarded portfolio that we have where we have not yet taken FID is obviously, and that's not a surprise to anyone, that is where we, ha we have some of, the, some of the bigger challenges and especially in the areas, and that will be the US portfolio, we will come back to that. That is where we have a fixed nominal offtake price and have had uh, higher uh, cost of capital and higher uh, capex inflation. That is where we are committing firmly to take all the actions needed, and that is both in terms of our supply chain and regulatory 
but also taking active choices to reconfigure projects. Like, for example, we announced recently with our Baltica 3 project. And as Rasmus will tell you about, that project was actually NPV positive, but just not good enough to take an FID, which is why we took a decision to reconfigure the project. And you'll hear more details about that later. And then the last bucket is what we have not yet won yet. But that is where we have well above 100 gigawatts of high quality pipeline to pick from. And we are recommitting, as we'll tell you later, we are re recommitting to an absolute industry leading 150 to 300 basis points spread to WAC. And we are also committing and convinced that we can deliver a future portfolio which will deliver within that, not least due to the fact that the prices and the revenue is also going up, delivering higher absolute IRRs despite the higher cost of capital. So all in all, across all these four buckets, convinced that we are in an extremely strong position to drive value creation. But as I mentioned, let me take a little bit of a deeper dive into what are we doing with the awarded portfolio, which is where we are fighting the hardest to ensure that we come to the place we want them to be. Well, we are working intensely with our supply chain. And for some of these products, quite honestly, we are going back to our major and most uh, important and biggest suppliers and saying, you need to help us find additional cost savings that can improve these products. That's an active dialogue that's been well received, professionally received, and our suppliers are leaning in to say, what can we do to ensure that we get to a better cost position in light of the capex inflation that we have seen? But we also, in continuous dialogue with the regulators, and very tangible examples of that would be the Power Act from uh, Maryland, where recently the state of Maryland, where we have our Skipjack project, approved that there would now be a full uh, passback of Inflation Reduction Act benefits, which of course is a huge uplift, because previously there was an 80% passback clause of those benefits to the ratepayers. So we are seeing that the heavy lifting we are doing on the regulatory front actually delivers tangible benefits, and as you may have noticed, might not. We've also, as late as yesterday, actually officially filed a petition to get a retrospective inflation indexing for the Sunrise project in New York, which would be a meaningful uplift to the ORIC price should that be approved. So we continue those dialogues and do clearly meet a strong reception and understanding that something needs to happen. We are also generally pursuing revenue optimization because in some cases there will be a limit to how much we can do about the capex, but the revenue optimization driven by the merchant flexibility that we have, but also driven by driving highly value creating power purchase agreements with big companies. And I will mention just one which I think is an interesting data point, namely that we've seen just over the last 12 months the PPA levels, price levels have gone up by 50 to 60 percent, even in light of, even in light of the weakening power, the softening power prices that we've seen recently. We are still at very meaningfully higher le PPA levels than we have seen before, which is yet another strong indicator of, of us being able to deliver stronger revenue. And some of these projects, we still have that opportunity. As I mentioned, we are reconfiguring some of our projects, and th there will typically be those where we do have limited sunk cost and where we still have some flexibility on the timeline. And examples of that would be Baltic 3, but also our Ocean Wind 2 project in the US, which David will come back to. And last but not least, and that may be a new word here from us, but we also explicitly saying if we can get not get our projects to sufficient value creation and therefore not be a responsible use of our investors' money, then we are prepared to walk away from these projects. We will come back to that throughout this, but not least in David's presentation, because this is primarily a US challenge. Now, if you look at the position we have both for the awarded portfolio, but also in general, we find ourselves in a uniquely strong position to continue to drive competitive advances and drive growth. And if you look at the commercial dimension first, our ability to continue to develop and drive highest quality pipeline is something we have absolutely no doubt is industry leading, not least in offshore where we are obviously both the biggest and the most experienced player in the world. And we have seen just since the last Capital Markets Day, our total pipeline go up by 70%. So that's a very massive increase. You'll also see us, and we talked about that quite a bit, to be us continuing to be extremely disciplined in our bidding. So we chose not to bid, for example, in Massachusetts, we chose not to bid in Taiwan round 3-1. We, 
We, are, we did not bid in California seabed. We stepped out in time in the New York bite, uh, seabed lease auctions. And we also have recently uh, decided to step down our uh, market development activities in Vietnam because we do not believe that compared to the other opportunities that we have, that Vietnam is a sufficiently attractive market. It's still a really important supplier market, but for market development, we are pulling back from that to prioritize other areas with higher value creation potential. We are also very confident in our proven uh, flexible financing approach, i.e. our farm down model. Uh, as I mentioned, we have farmed down effectively 2.2 gigawatts at very high retention rate, and we see no reason and we have no indications that that is weakening despite the obvious tighter capital markets that we are looking at. And then last but not least, and this is something we will, be, will be only be more important in the future, our relations to the corporate partners, to strategic partnerships with the likes of Amazon, with BASF. So Amazon, we, we're doing PPAs and we have other really exciting initiatives. We just made with the carbon capture and storage project that we won, Denmark's first and largest, where we'll capture more than 400,000 tons of biogenic CO2 every year. We made the world's largest negative emissions uh, offtake agreement with Microsoft with over 3 million tons of biogenic CO2. We are, as you are surely aware, we have the world's largest corporate PPA with TSMC for 920 megawatts. And we are, continue, we are convinced that continuing to not only trade with those partners, but innovate new solutions that will benefit what we do across technologies is something that is a unique capability that we possess. If we turn to the EPC and operations area, we are in a position where both our technical skills, but also our execution ability is very strong. My colleagues Virginie and, and Richard will come back to that in much more detail. But this, I'll just mention that despite the fact that delays that we have had uh, on Shangwa uh, Project 1 and 2A, but also on Hornsey 2, obviously have raised questions saying, is Ørsted losing its, its execution ability? And we would argue every day of the week that that is not the case. And just take Hornsey 2 as an example. Under extremely challenging circumstances where we had an Omicron outbreak, it was hard to man the ships, we had an extreme weather in February, all of those factors. We managed to be only two months delayed on the world's largest offshore wind farm. And as a matter of fact, we were the only UK infrastructure construction project without one single shutdown during the entire COVID period. So I would claim that we still have a clearly and market leading execution ability, which will continue to leverage and continue to strengthen. And as mentioned, we will clearly come back to that. And very important, and maybe even more important than it's ever been before, our long-standing relations to our supply chain is extremely important. Virginie will tell you more about it, but we have a very high share of contracted CapEx already booked and with a price certainty going into the portfolio we need to build. And both the trust that we have with our, the relations, both also the scale we can offer and the technical capabilities where we lean in to help our supply chain scale. And we have multiple examples of what we have done to not just get our fair share of the total capacity, but also how we help the supply chain scale to the greater good of the entire scalability of our supply chain. And last but not least, I will mention something that has become increasingly clear in its importance is a regulatory strength that we have. The way we can work with regulators to create a more scalable, a better, and a more attractive uh, condition for our industry and for Orsted not least in the US, but also examples in Poland, where we work with our partner, PGE, and other industry actors to ensure that we can euro denominate uh, the, the income, which would take, which significantly lowers the, the risk adjusted cost of capital. So, all in all, with these as examples, you can trust us to both continue to have, deploy, and develop the absolutely market leading capabilities that we are sure that we have. And if you look at our ability, to deploy those capabilities, we have recently taken a, a decision to restructure the way we go to market. Or in essence, we've had that we are now looking at the world not primarily in technology, so in offshore and onshore and power tracks, but we integrated onshore and offshore into three regions. So Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific. And why are we doing that? It is simply because to ensure we are seeing that the markets are becoming increasingly different and we have been extremely successful for years 
exporting, you can call simplified, a North Sea model for offshore, taking that to other parts of the world. But due to political priorities, local considerations about supply chain, it's becoming increasingly difficult and different to navigate. And by giving a much higher degree of empowerment to our regional setups across technologies and leveraging those synergies, we can work much closer, both regulatory but com also commercially with customers, bringing us closer to the customers in each of those regions with, as mentioned, a higher empowerment to the CEOs and the teams of each of the three regions. And at the same time, we are choosing to keep our EPC orga organization as a global organization, which will marshal the scale, but also the deployment of the capabilities, which would not be wise to copy everywhere. Because the capabilities you need to deploy a massive infrastructure project on time and on budget are not that different. But working with your customers, your stakeholders, your regulators is indeed very different. So that is how we find the best of working with market proximity, but at the same time also to ensure that we work with scale in deploying the capabilities we built up over several decades. But we are also keeping our power to x organization global, because that is a market that does not exist. As it said on my previous slide where I talked about growth, this is a market that has less than one gigawatt of operational electrolyzer capacity right now. We aim to be a catalyst for making that happen. And we aim to work with off-takers that are in many cases really global. And that means that a global model where we can deploy learnings across the world because we don't have the regional scale yet is something that we believe will be us, bring us in the best position to successfully deploy but also scale in a risk mitigated way the new technologies both on uh, electrolysis, but also working with off-takers and, if we use green fuels, the synthesis processes. And it, let's just take a look at the choices we're making, starting with offshore. Offshore, extremely important that we have absolutely no doubt about our ambition to, to stay and strengthen our position as a global leader. We are not concerned about that, that that will not be the case. Because, as I mentioned, we are well over twice as big as number two today, and we uphold extremely high ambitions to ensure that we continue to drive and shape that market. We will be extremely focused on value creation. We will have a disciplined bidding approach. And we will also ensure, as we already announced a couple of years back, to dive into a focused and prioritized deployment of floating technology. We have the UK, Spain, and Norway as our priority markets right now, but we'll also keep our eyes open to high potential opportunities in Asia Pacific. And on onshore, we will be looking at continuing to strengthen ourselves as a significant regional player. US will continue to be our main growth market in onshore. But we're also choosing to play in the top priority European markets. And as a matter of fact, the five markets that we are prioritizing, four of those are the four largest Euro markets in Europe. And we believe there's very big potential of that, not least in wake of the energy crisis that we, even though it doesn't feel that way, surely still have in Europe. And that holds a huge potential, which we're already seeing materializing in significant value creation and a strongly increasing pipeline, as Rasmus will come back to. And we're also very happy about the diversified earnings that we have due to both the different loads profiles, but also the different timelines that we're all aware of is between onshore and offshore. And not least on power to x we will be driving, we will be a market shaper. Or as we said a few times, we'd be a catalyst for change. And we would do that in a risk, we would do that in a, in a risk sensible way. So we're not going out from zero to several gigawatts and saying we will build the huge projects right away. As Olivia will tell you about, we like to take a very risk mitigated approach to the small and medium sized projects to ensure we get the learnings to scale and we will be very selective in the way we do this. We will be working in a few European countries and the US in a hub structure which will ensure that we, are, we will actually create impact where we choose to operate and we will primarily focus on renewable hydrogen for industrials, not least in Germany and then we will focus on e-methanol which also a recent report from Shell showed is probably the most scalable of the near term uh, fuels that we could see, for example, for a sector like shipping. Let us a, take a look at what that means in terms of the plan that we have. So the total self-funded plan, and I want to reiterate that, the total self-funded plan is one that is still at uh, the 50, approximately 50 gigawatts. It is largely unchanged. 
As a matter of fact, it is completely unchanged on the 50 gigawatts. But we are doing some adjustments in the technology mix behind that. And you will notice that we are now being explicit for the first time on power tracks where we say around 2 gigawatts of operational electrolyzer capacity, which may not sound like a lot, but considering that the total global electrolyzer capacity is well below 1, it is not unambitious, but still something we believe and are convinced can be done in a risk mitigated and a wise way. And you will also notice, obviously, that offshore going from approximately 30 gigawatts to now approximately 28 gigawatts. And uh, you could say, so is this because you needed to find for something for power to X, or is it because you cannot afford it within your capital structure? Fact is that this is a direct result of us taking a very high priority to value creation. So when we say we choose to reconfigure a few projects, that also means that we are now, do not now, right now, not have a known timeline for those projects. And we do not want to let ourselves force to do projects that we are sure we could grow with, but would not create sufficient value for our investors. So this is a reflection that we are convinced we can deliver approximately 28 gigawatts of value creating offshore. And we are strong believers of the long-term value creation in offshore. We have no doubt that that is the case. And we'll come back to in greater detail why we believe that is the case. But right now, towards 2030, we believe this plan is the best we can deliver focusing on value creation, which is an absolute top priority right now. We will have Europe being the biggest region uh, in terms of CapEx, closely followed by the US. If we look at what CapEx that drives, surely not a surprise, because I'm sure you've been flipping the deck from this morning. Uh, this is, uh, we are looking at an approximately 475 billion DKK investment program. This is one that will make us, surely make us one of the largest uh, green energy investors in the world, if not the largest. And you will still see that approximately 70%, so by far the majority, goes into offshore. So even though we are deploying capital to power to X, even though we are still very ambitious on our onshore, there's no doubt that the majority of our CapEx deployment is still in offshore. And by the way, in offshore, that delivers a very high degree, continued very high degree of contracted uh, and, and known earnings for the future. So this is, uh, this is uh, an area where we will be, where we'll be ambitiously driving forward, and we are convinced that we can do this in a value-creating way. In terms of our value-creating ambitions, as I mentioned, we are firmly committed to an industry-leading 150 to 300 basis point spread to WAC. And I want to reiterate, even though I'm sure it is known to you, based on the unlevered, uh, fully loaded lifecycle IRR, we are not in a position where we can compare those return requirements to those of our peers. Daniel will give you more detail about it. But if we, take, if we actually take out those DEVEX and fixed costs, this is not a comparable figure. This is a very, very ambitious value creation range. And we are convinced we can do that because the absolute, absolute IRRs that we can deliver are some where we are already now seeing the data points coming. I mentioned the 50 to 60 percent uh, uh, PPA levels going up, but also just a dating point from, data point from the recent uh, Irish uh, auric auction in, um, in, the, in, in offshore. That was at, as, at 87 euro or 86 euro per megawatt hour. That's a totally different level than we've seen, for example, in the UK. So strong indications that we are seeing those price levels go up. And um, if we look at what that will result in, then the earnings that we're looking at, I'll take you back just briefly to remind you that what we communicated last time at our CMD was an approximately 12% earnings growth towards 2027. We are now looking at a meaningfully higher earnings growth towards 2030. And we're also looking at a higher return on capital. And this is, as Daniel will tell you more about, with a very high degree of certainty. We, are, we have a very high share of those operational earnings already with a clear visibility, although it is seven years out into the future. So we believe very healthy returns based on also assumptions that the, that the, that the, that the value we will create from the new products and where we will get to with our existing products 
is something that will be strongly value creating. And let me now turn to another extremely important priority, namely sustainability. Sustainability is at the very core of our strategy. It is not something we do on the side, it's not a department, it's at the very core of how we actually do things. And we continue to be an absolute leader in terms of the ambitions that we set. If you look at our, I, mean, I already mentioned the scope one and two, carbon neutrality by 2025. We were one of only seven companies in the world across all sectors who got our net zero 2040 plan science-based approved. We'll show you a video with my colleague Inger later, actually what we do. But also on nature-based, so on biodiversity, we already announced previously that we will do no projects where we do not have a net positive biodiversity effect. And we, as late as a couple of days ago, announced also that not only ban of landfill of turbine blades, but also of solar panels, where we will already now be working with partners to have the technical solution to make that reusable. On the social dimension, just one example of that, we have an ambitious 40-60 split between gender, with the underrepresented gender, and that is both at total employee base, but also at all leadership positions. And on the governance side, we will be taking, we will only be deploying sustainable green financing, and we have all of our projects taxonomy aligned. Those are only examples of our industry-leading ambitions, and we are taking action to drive these. Just a couple of examples would be the global partnership that we have done with World Wildlife Foundation, which is focused on creating both measures, but also to create tangible and scalable action, not just for us, but for the entire industry on ocean biodiversity. Our oceans are not in a great shape, and we need to do something around that in a way that is scalable. And likewise, with the Nature Conservancy, We've donated 1,000 acres of rare long grass prairie as part of one of our solar projects to the Nature Conservancy for conservation. And that's not something we do for philanthropy. That is because we are convinced it's both the right thing to do and because we believe this will be an ever impor more important part of creating both competitive advantage, differentiation, and the acceptance both of our customers and our investors. Talking about ocean biodiversity, I'm extremely proud to announce that we are now the first uh, energy company in the world who is issuing a blue bond. So focusing investment or the, the, the capital that we will raise 100 million euro on uh, ocean biodiversity activities and decarbonizing the maritime sector. So specifically targeted that. And this is something that we need a lot more because we need to have scalable financing to deploy into not least ocean biodiversity and making our oceans healthy. And we are proud to once again be a world's first on something we believe will be a massive factor in scaling something that's going to be important, extremely important for all of us. And closely, before the f I finish, let me talk about people. Because without people, without the talent in the organization, with the partners we work with, and also with our customers, we are not able to deliver what we need to. And uh, we take lots of very tangible and industry-leading initiatives. And I'll just give you a few data points around that. We have a global graduate program with, sort of, uh, with a limited number of positions. We got 4,200 global applicants from all over the world for that. There was a 50% increase over the year before. And this is an indication that the number of top quality people who wants to work for the industry leader, who is one of the very few absolute pure players in renewables, is massive. But also for the people we already have working for us at all leadership levels, we have systematic programs for how to develop, train, and challenge that talent. Uh, and this is something that is, we, we are convinced is an absolute top rate across any company in, in the world. And this leads, just as th with those examples, this leads to also us focusing very much on saying, so what is the attrition that we have? Because as most companies during the pan pandemic saw, this curve is saying, first, nobody left, and then everybody left. We had what I think Howard Business School called the Great Resignation. We are seeing that steadily come down. And that is also a result of the well above benchmark that we have in employee motivation and satisfaction. And last but not least, I'll, verse, I'll mention that on, uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, we take lots of initiatives, including having what we call employee-driven inclusion networks, which is a way to mobilize and engage our employees from all over the world in ensuring that we become an even more inclusive workplace. 
And with that, let me sum up what I'm essentially telling you in this very first part as an appetizer to the rest of the program. We will, in our business, and not least in our offshore business, be driving towards a, a very selective approach with a very strong focus on value creation. We will maintain, if not strengthen, our global leadership in offshore wind in all three regions. We will continue to strengthen our position as a significant regional and selective player in onshore and continue to be a market shaper in power to x We will deploy our massive pipeline, well over 100 gigawatt pipeline, to ensure that we deliver the approximately 50 gigawatts of operational capacity per year. And that will, by the way, not just be 50 gigawatts that's comparable to everybody else, because, because, but because a majority is offshore with much higher load factors, we will be a significantly one of the most, the biggest producers of green power in the world, even though we might not have the highest gigawatt number in installed capacity due to the technology mix that we have. And last but not least, we will deliver significant earnings and capital uh, growth, uh, capital return growth, and as Daniel will tell you more about, we will also uphold and, and, and prolong our dividend commitment to give that certainty for our investors as well. All of this to become what we clearly aim to be, namely the world's leading green energy major. And with that, let me uh, hand over the Depeche and, uh, and move on. We will uh, be going into the rest of the program. So hope that at this at least gives you an overview that you know the overall direction of travel before we go into more detail. Thank you very much. Blades, towers, foundations, cables, vessels. All fundamental in building new offshore wind farms to provide the world with the green energy it needs. But producing steel and blades and powering vessels are sources of greenhouse gas emissions. As we accelerate the build out of green energy, it is vital to reduce these emissions in our supply chains. In fact, this is one of the biggest challenges we face to meeting our industry leading target of building net zero wind farms by 2040. To overcome it, we need to take action with our partners. As the world's largest offshore wind developer, we can lead our industry by creating incentives for our suppliers to invest in low carbon technologies. That is why we are partnering with our strategic suppliers to mature and test low carbon solutions in our wind farms so they become commercially scalable. We are focusing on the major emissions drivers across the life cycle of a wind farm. From blades and towers to foundations, cables and vessels. Let's have a closer look at the industry first solutions we are developing with our partners to tackle emissions. The largest source of an offshore wind farm's carbon emissions comes from the steel that goes into its foundations. By using renewable energy when manufacturing foundation components, we can address this issue. We are pleased to announce that we are now partnering with Dillinger to develop the world's first low carbon foundations made with renewable hydrogen and scrap steel. The second largest source of emissions comes from the fuels used by the vessels at our offshore wind farms. To address this issue, we will be testing crew transfer vessels that run on electricity and e-methanol. We will operate them at full scale in our wind farm operations at Barrow and Lynx in the UK. Many of the blades in operation today need to be recycled soon. But blades are made of composite materials that are difficult to recycle. This is the biggest circularity challenge facing our industry. To address this, we are pleased to announce that we are entering an industry-first partnership with Vestas. Vestas has developed a new technology that can break down the composite materials in existing blades 
and used the recovered epoxy resin to manufacture new blades. When ready, we will procure and install these blades made with recycled materials in all future wind farms where we collaborate. When looking at an entire wind farm, these solutions have the potential to significantly reduce emissions. Together with our partners, we are driving the integration of new low carbon solutions in a cost efficient way and building the capabilities to continue future proofing our world class operating model. Ultimately, these initiatives will enable us to meet future customer demand for decarbonized wind farms. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rasmus Erbo. Uh, I am the CEO of our European business. I have been with Ørsted for a little bit more than 11 years in, uh, in many different roles, uh, most recently as the regional head for continental Europe. I will, uh, I will spend my time today uh, giving you a strategic update on how we are doing in Europe as of now. And I would like to, to start out by giving you a snapshot overview of our portfolio, so as it stands right now, and then followed by a quick walkthrough of what we have achieved since the last Capital Markets Day. We constructed the first wind farm uh, offshore in the world uh, more than 30 years ago. And we have today uh, 27 operational wind farms uh, across Europe. That makes us a major green power producer, and it also makes us the un undisputed uh, regional leader uh, of offshore wind in Europe. But what it also does is that it allows, it, it allows us to compete uh, from a position of strength. And we do so uh, due to the depth of our capability and also simply due to the size of our portfolio. We have uh, roughly 18 gigawatts of what we call firm capacity in Europe right now. Um, 15, a little bit more than 15 offshore, one gigawatt onshore, and two gigawatts in our Danish bioenergy business. Before I, I go through the list here, I would like to, to leave you with one point. During the last couple of years, we all know that Europe has been going through unprecedented turmoil in the energy markets. And to me, it speaks quite a bit to our uh, capability as an organization that during this period of time, we have been able to deliver on all of our key milestones. And it gives me personally a very strong conviction in our ability to continue to deliver going forward. What I will do now is uh, start looking ahead. Uh, I would like to take you through our four key strategic priorities for Europe for the next uh, 12 to 24 months. First of all, we will deliver on our awarded portfolio with sufficient value creation, i.e. Horn C3 and Baltica 2 and 3. I will, of course, come back to that. Number two. We will win up to six gigawatts of offshore wind capacity, and we will do so um, using multiple different avenues. So centralized tenders, decentralized tenders, uh, greenfield, open door, developer-led build-out. Finding the best way to the most value-creating green electron for us. Number three, we will leverage the onshore platform we have now established uh, throughout the last two years and deliver uh, another three gigawatts of value creating growth. And then finally, we will lead the structural shift that we are seeing right now towards more corporate led demand and deliver on our strategic corporate partners decarbonization needs. I will now double click on number one, starting with Horn C3. We continue to progress Horn C3, and we expect to take FID during 2023. 
Um, on value creation, we expect the value to progress towards our guided range uh, through uh, lever maturation and in general further maturation of the project on scope, schedule and cost. I am firmly convinced that we will get there. Uh, and there are specifically three areas that we are spending a lot of time on right now. First of all, uh, on the whole CapEx part, we are working hard with our suppliers to get the needed robustness uh, in the case and get a very high proportion of secured CapEx uh, on price uh, and also on volume, building further on the two thirds that we had uh, secured at uh, FID last year. Secondly, we should remember that this is a massive offshore wind farm that is part of the biggest offshore wind cluster in the world. That also means that we see significant scale benefits uh, on this farm and we continue to build on that. And to illustrate my, my point uh, with an example, um, our OPEX per megawatt on this offshore wind farm is more than 25% lower than what it uh, uh, is on Hornsea 2 driven by turbine scale, but also the cluster effects. And last but not least, on revenue. We have a CFD contract here that provides you with a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do on corporate PPAs, on uh, delaying uh, the CFD. Especially on corporate PPAs, uh, we have an option in the framework to basically uh, pass back up to 25% of the CFD and then either take that merchant or through corporate PPAs, which we would obviously only do if it would improve our business case. So with all of these things, as I said before, that gives me a strong conviction that we will get there. Moving on to Baltica 2 and 3 in Poland, so the other half roughly of our awarded uh, capacity. We entered into the JV on this project uh, two and a half years ago, roughly. So in other words, just before um, the uh, world, uh, on, in terms of the energy market, fundamentally changed in Europe, and also uh, very much in Poland, in terms of the depreciation of the slot. But, but fort fortunately, due to our leading development capabilities, we were able to see the writing on the wall very, very early on these projects. And together with our partner PGE and other uh, incumbents, uh, we managed to agree with the Polish government to make some very fundamental changes to the CFD with retrospective effect. Due to these changes, we are now at a place where we see sufficient value creation in Baltica 2, so that is one and a half gigawatts out of the two and a half. And we are moving that project forward according to plan towards expected COD in 27. As Mass also alluded to, on, on Baltica 3, the story is slightly different. Here, uh, despite the fact that we actually do see a positive life cycle spread to WAC on this project, we have decided together with our partner to take a step back because it simply did not meet uh, Ørsted's return requirements and reconfigure the project, taking advantage of the fact that we have flexibility on the timeline with the CFD the way it is. And more specifically, what we are doing right now is three different things. Um, first of all, we are reopening the permit. We are seeing if we can reconfigure the project, potentially get a bigger turbine. We are uh, canceling and retendering significant scopes uh, again, leveraging the flexibility on the timeline. And then finally, um, we recently uh, won another 210 megawatt of awarded capacity in Poland together with our partner uh, PG. And we are exploring uh, whether we can construct that together with Baltica 3 and then have a slightly uh, bigger project, which would benefit the business case. That was an update on the awarded portfolio. And I would like uh, now sort of uh, switch on to uh, strategic project number two, 
um, double clicking on how do we get to the best and most value creating green electrons for us. Before I get into the details, um, I will just take a step back with you and provide you with a little bit of context. Um, there is no doubt, as Mass also alluded to, that we are standing at the brink of a new era for offshore wind in Europe, no doubt about it. Uh, but for me personally, I actually don't spend so much time thinking about whether the number behind me in 2030 installed capacity will be 130 or 140 or 150. In all scenarios, the growth will be massive. So where we do spend our time is finding the best gigawatts in this space. Two words on the regulatory framework. Um, overall, we are pleased with what we are seeing across Europe with the multiple packages that has been coming out of the European Commission. Um, it is an evolution. It is not a revolution. But as said, overall, we are pleased with the direction of travel. Where I would instead like to spend a good deal of my time is to give you some insights into how do we think about the markets. How do we maneuver in this space of opportunity? Because the way we think about markets is that it is much, much more than a flag on a piece of paper. You need to carefully think about where you are and why. We focus our bottom fixed offshore wind growth uh, in five core markets. So uh, the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark and Poland. Centered around the Irish Sea, uh, the North Sea and the lower part of the Baltic Sea region. And to give you an indication of, of uh, the numbers, we spend roughly 80% of our DIVX in 23 in these markets. That also means the vast majority of our time and our attention. We also uh, are active in what we call new adjacent markets uh, for bottom fixed offshore wind. So that would be Ireland, Belgium, uh, Norway and Sweden. And here we spend roughly 80% of our DIVX. But zooming in on, on the way we think about this, so we, we carefully think, think about a set where we want to be. So when we look at a market, we obviously look at the attractiveness, what is the robustness of the pipeline, what is the political stability, what is the transparency of the system, and so on. But what we also really test ourselves on before we go in, and also when we decide to stay, is our ability to be a market shaper, not a taker either in our own right or together with our partners. As you see with us partnering up with ESB in Ireland recently, BASF in Germany uh, in their home market, I will come back to that, uh, PGE in Poland, the national incumbent, CIP on Danish open door. Um, that, that's an important part for us to be a shaper. And then finally, what we also look for uh, increasingly much actually when we look at our portfolio is not to be blinded by the tenders. I will come back to the tenders, but we are looking for multiple avenues to the growth. We are looking for, as I said before, different kinds of auctions, greenfield, developer led build out, and so on. Another thing that has, has fundamentally changed uh, in Europe uh, due to the same drivers, of course, in the last couple of years, is the sheer volume of gigawatts for bottom fixed offshore wind that is being tendered out in the short term. So in the, in the markets that are relevant for Ørsted, as I mentioned before, for the rest of 23 and for 24, we will see a total of roughly 44 gigawatts being tendered out. So an average of 22 across the two years. And a good question to me would be, how, how will you make sure that you can win that in the most value creating manner? And, and my answer to that would be fourfold. First of all, our 
leading development capabilities. We have been doing this longer than anybody else. We have seen opportunities, we have seen more opportunities in Europe and globally than anybody else when it comes to offshore wind. We have a distinct capability to assess the opportunities and also do it early, see the risks and also see the opportunities and more importantly, to price the opportunities effectively. As a few examples, um, the view you might take on AEP, annual energy production, the, the view you might take on uh, the LCW curves for the coming years, the view you might take on your ability to generate value from the merchant exposure, the value of the green electron or the molecule, those assumptions can make or break your business case in an afternoon. We know what we're doing. Um, so, so, so this is, I think, a very important point for you to be aware of here. Secondly, uh, on partnerships, we have the right partnerships in place, uh, development partnerships, but also offtake partnerships. And also, we have an uh, ability to make them work for the longer term. And then finally, as Richard and Vicini will also talk about, we, we, we simply just have scale that we can leverage across our entire uh, value chain, but also simply in our market presence. Synergy cases as an example. Moving on, I would like to spend a little bit of time on floating before I then conclude on what does the pipeline look like for us in Europe for offshore wind uh, in the coming years. The one-liner on floating is that things are going according to plan. We are delivering on the strategic uh, trajectory that we set two years ago. We are uh, building our organization, we are staging our capability building, and we are building a portfolio with a lot of optionality pre and post 2030, which is very important to us. More specifically, what we have, what we have done is that we have also here decided to focus. So we are in three markets. We are in Norway, the UK and Iberia. We have secured a uh, gross 1.1 gigawatt in the UK of leases that we are now maturing together with our partners. And we have entered into four development partnerships in the markets that I just mentioned. And then finally, we have also entered into a technology partnership with Acciona in Spain. So if you put this together and give you a consolidated view on offshore for Europe towards 2030. So we have a little bit more than 15 gigawatts in um, uh, uh, firm capacity. We have a uh, ambition to get to 19 to 21 gigawatts by 2030 installed in the water. And that would mean that we uh, have an ambition to get up to six gigawatts of uh, offshore wind. And we can do that from a pipeline of roughly 65 gigawatts of opportunity. Roughly 40 gigawatts in the core markets that I mentioned before, and then the remainder in our adjacent new markets. To me, this is a very, very robust pipeline. Moving on uh, and uh, going into strategic priority number three, which is on onshore. We have now, uh, you can say, set ourselves up uh, completely in Europe on onshore during the last couple of years. And we have done that centered around the two uh, platform acquisitions we have done, one in Ireland and UK and one in Germany and France. On top of that, we have entered into uh, Spain in our own right uh, and have entered into smaller development partnerships in Spain. I am incredibly pleased to see that we now have a team of almost 200 people working solely on onshore in Europe. And we have management teams in our onshore business with an average tenor of more than 20 years doing exactly this. As said, we are present in five markets, and as Mass also alluded to, that constitutes the vast majority of the growth that we will see in Europe across uh, onshore. And when I say onshore, it is, of course, onshore wind, um, storage, and solar. 
in terms of how we have been doing, we have uh, increased our installed base with uh, more than 30%. We now have 500 megawatts installed. Uh, and we are delivering uh, very safely uh, within our guided range in terms of value creation, both for our projects under construction and our awarded portfolio. Looking at the pipeline and our onshore value proposition. So as I said, we have roughly one gigawatt of firm capacity now, and we will add another three uh, to our pipeline towards 2030. Uh, installed capacity. We will do that from a pipeline of 9 gigawatts roughly, and that is a number that has significantly increased in the last couple of years. In terms of our substantiated pipeline, that is predominantly onshore wind, but in our opportunity pipeline you will see a roughly 50-50 split between onshore wind and uh, solar and storage, because we firmly believe that that is the right direction for, for us to take. I can come back to that. Our, our value proposition in one line is our ground game. We are incredibly close to our markets. We have people on the ground who have been there for a very long time and who has been developing and executing onshore opportunities. And then we have, as I said before, the right partnerships in place. And then finally, an important part of the why on onshore for us in Europe is the ability to move towards more integrated solutions across wind, solar, and storage. To alleviate the grid constraints, which is an increasingly big issue, but also, frankly speaking, to meet the needs of our strategic corporate partners who are looking for profiles like that. And that brings me to strategic priority number four and the last one. We are convinced that over the next couple of decades, we will see a fundamental structural shift from, you can say, government-led demand into more corporate-led demand. In the future, what the customer would like to see is the developer's ability to deliver the green electron at the right place, at the right time, with the right price, and with the right profile. And you can only do that if you have an integrated portfolio and an integrated capability. And also here we are strategically focused. We really spent the time thinking about where do we want to be. We have decided on focusing on only the, the largest strategic corporate partners. We have some criteria for that. Companies that are shapers in their industry. And then we are focusing on uh, global tech, uh, steel and uh, chemicals. And just to put these numbers in perspective for you, uh, so, 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 as a rule of thumb, uh, the demand numbers we see here roughly equates uh, 1,000 gigawatts of offshore wind globally, just to put it in perspective. The demand is huge. And we are already very well on the way. It's not just a strategic commitment that we have something we have decided to do, only we are doing it. So we have entered into more than a gigawatt of corporate PPAs, um, predominantly within these sectors, uh, in the last couple of years in Europe. Also predominantly offshore, which distinguishes us from our colleagues in the industry quite a bit. And also, uh, just as a data point, roughly two thirds of those corporate PPAs have been entered into with uh, strategic corporate partners, Amazon and Covestro. We have also uh, concluded an equity partnership with uh, German chemi chemical company BSF, the biggest one in the world, uh, in their home market to uh, develop offshore wind together. And then finally, we are uh, collaborating quite a bit with our strategic corporate partners on more uh, scalable green solutions. Um, an example of that collaboration is, for instance, as Mass also alluded to, when we are doing carbon capture with um, Microsoft. That brings me to my final slide. So, 
four key takeaways from me. First of all, we are a major green power producer in Europe. We are the undisputed regional leader for offshore wind and we compete from a position of strength. Number two, we will deliver on our awarded capacity in with sufficient value creation. Number three, we are extremely well positioned to get the most valuable gigawatts in Europe due to our capability and the size of our pipeline. And then finally, we are strategically committed to continue to work with our strategic corporate partners on meeting their decarbonization needs in Europe and also globally. Thank you very much for your time. With that, I will pass on to my dear colleague, David Hardy, who will now give you an update on where we are in US. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is David Hardy, and I lead our or Orsted's business in the Americas. I'm excited to be here today with all of you in London and to tell you a little bit about the progress we've made in the Americas region and the prospects that we have ahead of us. But first, maybe a short introduction on myself. I've been with Orsted since early 2020, and throughout that period, I've primarily led our offshore business in the Americas until the reorganization last November where my scope was expanded to include all of Orsted's activities in the Americas. Prior to Orsted, I spent approximately 10 years in senior executive roles with wind turbine OEM, Senvion, and Vestas, in both in the US and internationally. I lived in Germany for three years. And prior to that, I spent 20 years with primarily GE and the US Navy. Now I'd like to tell you about Orsted Americas. Since joining, the US market in 2015, Orsted has made significant progress in its footprint and prominence in the market. We're the only pure play developer in the US to have an installed base of onshore wind, onshore solar, energy storage, and offshore wind. We're one of the largest deployers of capital, and we're a, thought, a sought after thought leader on the clean energy, clean energy transition. You can see from the chart behind me that we have an in, impressive install base and a large portfolio of projects under construction and in development. I'd now like to just take a couple minutes and talk about some of the progress that we've made since the last Capital Markets Day. The first item on the list that I'm most excited about is that we're actually building, as we speak, America's first commercial scale offshore wind farm, the South Fork Wind Farm. 132 megawatt project off the coast of Long Island, New York. We actually expect to put our first foundations in the water within the next days. Super exciting. We've also matured our three near-term awarded portfolio projects. We'll talk about those more later, but we've matured them through the development cycle and we're approaching FID and have primarily cleared all the boundary conditions needed to take FID. And we've also been awarded two gigawatts two new projects in our offshore portfolio. On the onshore side, we've added two gigawatts of operating assets, and we have 1.6 gigawatts under construction. We've signed 24 corporate PPAs, and we're now entered in five US power markets. We also last year announced the first farm down of our uh, onshore portfolio, where we were able to retain 100% MPV on the farm down assets. This was a $2.0 billion, $2 billion DKK transaction, or $410 million transaction. And it's important for two reasons. One, it demonstrates the value that we're able to create in our onshore business in the Americas. And two, it demonstrates that we can take our farm down model into the US, even with the complex uh, capital structure with tax equity. Last, we've built a regional platform for growth going forward. When I joined, Orsted in early 2020, we were approximately 150 people across both parts of our business. Today, we're over 700 people in the Americas. So we're building a team to take us into the future. Now I'd like to talk about 
the important market shaping legislation that occurred in the US last year. Of course, this is the IRA. And I know many of you know a lot about the IRA already, but I just want to share a few specific examples of what it means to Orsted. So this is the largest investment in green energy in America. The expanded and the extension of the current tax credits will lead to significant growth for onshore and offshore renewables. And the new tax credits for energy storage and P to X will expand these benefits even further. You've seen charts like the one we have on the right-hand side. This is a chart from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance that talk about the growth. But maybe you don't appreciate the longevity that the IRA creates for the US market. For the first time, we have a 10-year runway of opportunity for us to really, as an industry, think strategically and build the long-term supply chains we need to have a more fruitful energy transi transi transition, long-term energy transition, as well as build uh, a more stable uh, renewables energy environment. If you've worked in renewables in the US like I have for the last few years, it's been quite cyclical. And now, hopefully, we've got a little bit of stability in policy. Last comment I'll comment on is that Orsted isn't just a beneficiary of the IRA. We actually helped shape the IRA. We gave tangible input to policymakers about how best to reduce the carbon emissions in the US and how to create the environment for business that would lead to long-term success of the industry. And today, we're still shaping the implementation of the IRA, as all the tax guidance hasn't actually been released from the US Treasury. Two important points of the IRA that I want to highlight, the energy communities benefit and the local content, domestic content benefits. We see these as really um, influential additions to our market here in the, in, in the US. And they'll really make a difference to the long-term offshore wind and onshore industry, but can actually help us in the short term as well and can play a significant, maybe play a significant uh, impact to improving our, sh our warded portfolio and offshore, especially given the market leading investments we've made in the domestic supply chain in the US in the last five years. Now I'd like to go on and talk about our priorities for the region. We have four key priorities for our region. The first is that we're very focused on maximizing value on our existing offshore wind portfolio. I probably spend 80% of my time on that. <laughs> we'll come back to that later and talk about it. We're also keen about the future of offshore wind in the US. And we, 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 we're bullish. We're long on the opportunities that we see there. And so we need to be shaping our market leading position and make sure that, that we're prepared for that next market phase. We see the benefits of the IRA. And we're growing our onshore business to take advantage of those and to build the next generation of customer solutions, integrated solutions, like Rasmus just spoke about. And last. I think it's important for us to shape the market for the long term and ensure a stable marketplace for Orsted in the Americas. I'll come back and talk about all four of these as I go through the rest of my presentation. So first, as I said, offshore wind is very important to us. And we're targeting to achieve 3 to 5 gigawatts of installed base by 2030. As we think about our existing and future portfolio for offshore wind, we're making strategic decisions. And the first strategic decision that I'd like to share with you today is the decision that we've made to focus solely on the mid-Atlantic and northeast markets of the East Coast. We see this as the best markets in the US for the following reasons. Those states need offshore wind in order to meet their decarbonization goals. Those states have high capacity targets today, and we expect those capacity targets to grow. The leases in those areas have good environmental attributes, wind speed, water depth, access to shore. We think that's important. And last, we believe that we can build a synergistic hub for offshore wind, taking advantage of our stakeholder relations that we've built, the supply chain that we're building, and of course, the operation and maintenance phase of the projects as we build this hub out. Next, I'd like to talk about our existing awarded portfolio. But before I talk about the projects, I want to just spend a minute and make sure that you understand how strong our existing portfolio is vis-a-vis -vis other portfolios in the US. Our existing portfolio comes with some fundamental advantages to others. 
This is anchored in the fact that we were early to get to buy our leases. We have some of the best leases in the market, and we paid very low prices for those original leases. So we start from a position of strength just from the leases that we have. Additionally, we've got some of the best offtake agreements. If you compare the portfolio of offtakes that we have across the states, it's very strong versus our competitors. And last, as you'll hear from my colleagues, uh, Richard and Virginie, we leveraged our EPC organization to really take advantage of our global scale and our, our supplier relationships to make early commitments to turbines and vessels before the latest cost increases. So a large portion of our existing portfolios capital commitments and CapEx, we, we secured early in time through frame agreements and, other, and other, um, other advantages that we have. So now I'll talk about our awarded portfolio. The first three projects on the top of the list we call our near-term awarded por portfolio. I'm going to come back to those. I have a whole separate slide on those. We're going to spend a few minutes on those. <laughs> Next we have Skipjack Win, which is our, our Maryland project. While the official COD date of Skipjack Win is 2026, there's a, there's a probability that this project could be delayed due to Q reforms in PJM, which is the transmission system that the project connects into. And if this project is delayed, we'll use this time to improve the project. Today, this project is from a life cycle IRR or MPV. It is positive, but it's not exactly where we, where we want it to be or in our targeted range. But it, this is an active project that we're still developing, and like I said, we'll use this extra time from, the, from a project delay to continue to improve the project and get it into our guided range. Next, we have Ocean Wind 2. You heard Mads talk about Ocean Wind 2 earlier. This is a project that in order for us to ensure that we get value creation, we've decided to reconfigure, and we're in active discussions with the state of New Jersey about what that means. It could mean project delays, different technology, or other value-adding activities. Now I'm going to talk about our near-term awarded portfolio. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this slide, so bear with me. <laughs> um, this, the takeaway of this slide is that we have confidence that we can create value in a forward-looking basis for the near-term awarded portfolio. Let me tell you what we mean by that. So first, it's important that I explain our current view of these projects. These, the current view of these th three projects is that they are um, MPV positive from a MPV neutral, I would say, or slightly positive to for, from a life cycle uh, M, M, from a life cycle uh, analysis calculation. But let me explain exactly what that means. First off, we're using our fully loaded, unlevered WAC framework, which is market dependent and technology dependent. So this WAC framework has been very heavily affected by the 250 basis point risk-free rate of the 10-year Treasury note in the US. So the WAC is much higher than at the time when, we were, when these projects were awarded. So that's the first assumption that you have to understand. The second is that we've, through our EPC organization, have basically got commitments, secured the CapEx uh, for almost all of the scopes for these three projects. Um, and although that those scopes are secured, that doesn't mean that we're not done working with our suppliers to try to continue to reduce cost, re-engineer, optimize, et cetera. So we're still working on that, but we've got a kind of a ceiling on the cost side. We're also making an assumption of a 40% ITC for all three projects. Now, with the latest guidance from Treasury, not all the projects actually meet the requirements for 40% ITC, but we believe that through our strong relationships with the federal government and the dialogues that we're having, that by the time the final guidance comes out, all three of these projects will qualify for either the energy community or the domestic content, additional 10% bonus ITC, or maybe both. And last, embedded in our calculation are some additional changes to the OREC's. As Mads alluded to earlier, just yesterday, we filed a petition with the state of New York, the Public Service Commission, who's the regulator, and we asked them to retroactively apply some attributes of the New York 3 um, RFP back retroactively to South Fork. These include inflation adjustment calculations and grid upgrade cost sharing. We don't know the outcome of that, but we have high confidence that the state will support us. Last, or in addition, we've been in discussions with New Jersey 
about making sure that we can get the full pass back of the IRA tax credits to Ocean Wind One. So it's all of these assumptions that go into our life 100% uh, neutral life cycle IRR for these projects. So you might ask the question, if these projects are life cycle neutral, why would you keep investing, David? And I have three answers for you. The first is that we've made some significant investments already. And when we look at the Ford IRR, when we look at the basis, uh, using that as a, as a basis for our calculation and decision making, the next kroner dollars that we put in to the projects will be value creating. And there's a lot of capital still to be deployed on these three projects. So we see that as an important metric and a, and a way for us to think about this project, these projects. Secondly, it is in fact actually the fact that we're investing in these projects and continue to invest in these projects, the states and federal government in the US want these projects to be successful. They need these projects for their carbon decarbonization goals. And so it is, the, it is our continued investment that is leading to them working with us to retool the, the offtake agreements and open up new uh, tax opportunities, tech, tax credit opportunities for us. So it's a little bit of a virtuous cycle. And last, I would say that there's a strategic benefit for us to build these projects. And I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail. But before I go on to the next slide and talk about the strategic value of building these projects, I want to just reemphasize one really important point that Matt's made and that Daniel will make. And that is that our standard going forward is still our fully loaded, 100% um, life cycle, uh, sorry, fully loaded life cycle um, WAC framework with 150 to 300 BIPs uh, spread to WAC uh, target. And so for projects like uh, Skipjack and Ocean Wind 2 and our new bids in Rhode Island and New York, that will be our standard. We just see the opportunity with these three projects for the reasons I just stated to use this forward looking IRR as, as our benchmark. But that won't be a, a precedent going forward. So now talking about the strategic value of building these projects. I see six things that will be a benefit to Orsted going forward if we build these projects. First is of course that we have our, our big pipeline of opportunity um, where we can bid from in the future. But if we build these projects, we'll also get some unique learnings from building the first projects and operating the first projects in the US. Built, installing turbines in US waters, building the first HVD system, built, working with stakeholders, et cetera. We'll also, the work that we're doing builds our reputation and our credibility. And that's, that's really important in our industry right now. We also keep our commitments to local communities, to build to, for supply chains, and as a first mover with, with labor. And finally, we're making investments in infrastructure, ports, and in supply chains. And by building these projects and completing those investments, those will give us a competitive advantage going forward with access to these infrastructure and, and capacity slots of local content, which is important for future domestic content requirements for additional tax credits in the US. So why is all this strategic investment important? It's because we believe in the long-term benefits and the long-term opportunity in offshore wind in the US. So, and why are, why are we bullish on offshore wind in the, in the long-term in the US? It's because the market's improving there. Like I said, the states and federal government want to see the success. So the federal government's funding resources for permitting. The IRA will make um, projects, will, 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 will add value to projects going forward. On the state side, New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Jersey, They've all changed their next phase of RFPs to include inflation adjustment and other cost sharing mechanisms to de-risk those projects for us. So we see the market as, as something that's improving and maturing and a place where we want to, want to be in the future. And that leads us to our recent announcement of the acquisition of Eversource's half of our so-called lease area 500. This is a, a lease that we've known for a long time it's a great lease. It has, again, good access to, to, to uh, shore, uh, nice shallow uh, depth, and some of the strongest wind and lowest wake in the US. So it's a very competitive lease. And we think that we also got a very good deal compared to other prices paid for leases recently. And it will allow us to build up to four gigawatts in this new improving market. 
But and we've already bid 2.3 gigawatts into New York and Rhode Island. And now, as the sole owner of this lease, we can be strategic about when, if we bring in a development partner on these, if we win these bids, or if we wait and farm down these after we've de-risked them. Like I said, these two bids, Rhode Island and New York, of course, we're going to stick to our targeted returns of 150 to 300 megawatts um, life cycle, fully loaded um, WAC framework. And we're confident that not only these projects, but all the future projects will be able to hit our targets in the US. I'd now like to shift to our onshore business. It's a very important part of our business in the US and for Orsted overall. We're on track to deliver 13 and a half gigawatts of onshore capacity by 2030. In addition to the 5.6 gigawatts of projects, 5.7 gigawatts of projects that are in operation or under construction, we have a large pipeline, 8.6 gigawatts of substantiated pipeline and 16.4 gigawatts of opportunity pipeline. This is a combination of onshore wind and onshore solar and storage. This year in 2023, we'll continue to expand our substantiated and opportunity pipeline as we move into our core markets. So those pipelines will grow this year. And in addition to our greenfield pipeline, which I'm describing here, our commercial team is out in the marketplace, scouring the market for good opportunities through M&A to augment our greenfield so that we can create the best value for Orsted and onshore. I'm confident that we'll continue to create value and continue our track record of success in the onshore business in the US, and that this, was, this will be an important part of our business going forward. In order to show the value of onshore, I want to just take a minute and give you two um, case studies on things that we've done in the US on the onshore side. But before I do, I want to highlight the strong success that we've had since our acquisition in 2018 of Lincoln Clean Energy. We've added 3.3 gigawatts of onshore assets in operation and more on the way, obviously, with the construction pipeline we have. And our returns are tracking above the initial expectations of the pro forma of the, of the transaction. So this has been a very great success for Orsted, and I'm very proud of the America's onshore team for the progress that they've made. Now onto the two case studies. The first is a project called Sunflower Wind. It's a late stage construction project in Kansas, onshore wind, uh, 214 megawatts. This was a project that we bought as part of an acquisition portfolio. And at the time, both we and the seller attributed very low value to this project. But after we bought it, we reconfigured the project, we leveraged our supply chain relationships and our origination capabilities, and we were able to create a project that's in, well within our value creation framework. This project will be COD just later this year. So great, great success for a project that we paid almost nothing for. Similarly, but different, 11 Mile. 11 Mile is a 300 megawatt solar project with 300 megawatt um, battery, four hour battery, uh, battery um, system, combined technology system. This is for our, our utility customer, SRP, in Arizona. The utility was trying to permit a gas-fired power plant, and their permits, they weren't able to get their permits through. And so they were scrambling to try to make up this capacity for their demand growth. And they came to Orsted, and we were one of the only companies at the time that could, that could complete the project, this complex project, in the short timeline that they wanted to have the project online by summer of 2024. Due to some of our supply chain relationships, um, and we were able to quickly make a deal with them, make a deal with our suppliers, use our engineering and procurement resources to bring this project to fruition. So this is an example of um, us fulfilling a customer need in, in, in these integrated solutions. And this is a third largest battery in America. So this isn't a small storage project. So I think these two case studies show the capabilities that Orsted is building in the onshore business, and again, I believe that this will be an important part of our equity story going forward. Now I'd just like to talk quickly about a few capabilities that we're building in the region. After the integration last November, we of course saw synergies across our business as we expected, but two things have really come, come forward. One is our ability to leverage the combined technologies to build these complex next generation multi-technology uh, solutions. We see this as an emerging trend and something that our customers are asking for, and that as, a, as one business in the region, we can really take advantage of. And second, 
Of course, as one integrated business, we can talk with one strong voice to customers, suppliers, and probably most important, stakeholders. You've heard me talk about throughout the, the presentation how strong we are in our stakeholder management in the US. And I think we're, 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 we're the best, actually, at that in the US. Um, and it's important for Orsted overall. And you heard Rasmus talk about the, the work that, that they've done in Europe. And of course, you know, we're going to do that in Asia and, and, and everywhere. But in the US, in, well, in the nascent industries of offshore wind, standalone storage, and P2X, it's even more important that we shape the industry. And so we'll continue to do that. And I'm confident that we can win bids, shape the industry, and actually achieve the results that we want if we're strong in our stakeholder management. So I'll just conclude with a few key highlights and reemphasize some of the things I already said. First, as one of the largest deployers of capital in the US, we're very well positioned to take advantage of this exciting market. Second, we're very focused on creating value on our existing offshore portfolio and preparing for the next generation of offshore wind in the US. And last, we see the benefits of the IRA. We'll continue to grow our onshore business, leverage our customer relationships, and solve our customers' energy transition needs. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over to Pear via video to talk about our APEC region. The Asia-Pacific region, it accounts for more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions and is extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change. It's also home to many countries with excellent potential for offshore wind. With good wind speeds, skilled workforces and industrial capabilities. We are seeing governments set ambitious green goals. And with over a third of all RE100 companies based in this region, we know there is high corporate demand for clean power. Towards 2030, more than 30 gigawatt offshore wind could be installed in Asia Pacific. And this could double to over 60 gigawatt by 2035. I'm confident about the long-term green transition in the APEC region. Let's take a look at the leading role Ørsted is already playing here. With almost two gigawatt offshore wind capacity in operation or under construction, we are the leading developer in Asia Pacific and have the most mature pipeline. We are present in the markets in Asia Pacific with the highest potential for offshore wind projects. And we are also positioning ourselves through our engineering and sourcing hubs. Taiwan is the home of our APEC headquarters and the regional front runner for offshore wind. Across Taiwan, Japan and Korea, we have a multi-gigawatt project pipeline. We have paused our market development activities in Vietnam, but still see this as an important supplier market. Earlier this year, we submitted a feasibility license application for Australia's first offshore wind zone off the coast of Victoria. We have struck a careful balance between building a local presence and retaining a cost-efficient setup in our markets. While we do see longer-term potential for onshore wind and solar, our current focus is offshore wind in Asia Pacific. In Taiwan, we are due to commission the final turbines for the 900 megawatt Greater Changhua 1 and 2A offshore wind farms this year. And this past March, we announced the board's final investment decision to build our second batch of utility scale projects, the 920 megawatt Greater Changhua 2B and 4 offshore wind farms. We take our responsibility to prioritize value creation seriously. For example, we did not bid in the previous round in Taiwan. We took stock of the limitations set by the regulation, including project size and content restrictions, and concluded that we could not make the projects investable at that point. However, I feel positive that improvements to the framework in Taiwan this year will ensure further successful build-outs of offshore wind. 
Ultimately, there are fundamental reasons why Greater Tsinghua 2B and 4 is viable. This is a large-scale project with full flexibility on local content requirements and long-term stable revenue based on an offtake agreement. Working in partnership has been at the heart of making it happen. We have utilized Ørsted's network of regional and global supply chain relationships to optimize our capital expenditure. Most significantly, we secured the world's largest corporate power purchase agreement of its kind with TSMC, Taiwan's semiconductor giant. TSMC will offtake the full production of our 920 megawatt wind farm for a fixed price 20 year term. For Ørsted, this landmark agreement confirmed our belief that CPPAs, alongside supportive regulatory frameworks, are a key part of the future success for renewable energy. We have started project construction and will be ready to deliver clean energy for our partner, TSMC, on time. Looking ahead, we will apply the learnings from our projects in Taiwan and around the world to our multi-gigawatt APAC pipeline. We are building a strong reputation as a reliable green energy partner to governments and corporates to catalyze Asia's green transition. All right, so this concludes the first part of the presentation. We will uh, now take a short break and uh, be back here in approximately 17, 18 minutes at 12 o'clock. So thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming back so promptly from your coffee break. My name is Olivia Breeze, and I'm the CEO of our Power to X business. I've been with us since 2012 in a variety of commercial leadership roles across strategic joint ventures and M&A, market development, and commercial innovation, all highly relevant areas for this very new element of Ørsted's portfolio. So I'm looking forward to taking you through how we at Ørsted see the emerging power to x market, how and where we will create value, and then looking in a little bit more detail at our development portfolio and pipeline, and in particular at Flagship One, the e-methanol project we took a final investment decision on in December of last year. But first of all, why is power to x important? Well, if you believe in a world that runs entirely on green energy, then you, of course, want to decarbonize as much as you can with green electrons. But you cannot get to net zero only with electrons, because approximately 30% of global emissions come from the hard to abate or hard to electrify sectors, such as heavy transport, heavy industry, and chemicals. And these sectors need different solutions. For these sectors, we have power to x and power to x is the umbrella term for taking renewable electricity, and the cost of renewable electricity constitutes approximately 50% of the outturn cost of green hydrogen. So you take your renewable electricity, you either turn it into green hydrogen through electrolysis, or you further synthesize that green hydrogen, and you create e-ammonia, or you add biogenic carbon, and you create e-methanol, or ultimately e-kerosene. And both hydrogen and ammonia are already significant energy carriers across the world. Indeed, in 19, in, let's get my years right, indeed, in 2021, there were already 91 million tons of hydrogen being used. But all of that, car, all of that hydrogen, pretty much, was fossil-based hydrogen. And so with not only that very, very strong existing demand, but also 
the additional demand which comes from these new verticals, you can see that the demand growth for renewable hydrogen and its derivatives is only continuing to grow until 2050. Now, as Mad said, we've shown you charts like this before, except the difference between this chart and the chart that we showed you in 2021 is that number, the number on the far right, that's continued to grow. The thing that hasn't changed is the number on the far left. Over the last two years, we've not seen significant tangible movement in terms of actual production of hydrogen and e-fuels. There have been a couple of notable FIDs, obviously including ours, but there, is not, there has not been the fundamental shift towards tangible action that everybody was expecting in 2021. But we are confident that 2023 will be the year when we start to see that tangible action. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is that there are very strong now renewable, uh, sorry, regulatory commitments, both coming out of the US with the IRA and in Europe with the Green Hydrogen Bank, where we are seeing actual money being put in support of the production of green hydrogen. Also in Europe, we are seeing demand being incentivized, mandated to decarbonize, not only through EU ETS and the RED3 directives, but also through refuel, aviation, and maritime. In addition, we are seeing forward-leaning demand sectors, so private actors taking tangible steps now to decarbonize. And you've heard my colleague Ingrid talk about Dillinger's approach to decarbonizing green steel using green hydrogen. Our partner, Maersk, is similarly taking a very forward-leaning approach to decarbonizing their shipping operations. They've ordered 19 dual fuel vessels, vessels that run both on e-methanol but also on conventional bunker fuel, and that's only a small proportion of the total number of more than 100 ships which have been ordered across the industry to be delivered before 2028. So with those clear market signals and the demand, we, you can see why we consider that Power2x has the ability to create significant value to Ersted. And it will really do that in two ways. The first is through absolute standalone value. So with the demand opportunity that I showed on the previous slide, you can see that we will be able, through our power to x business, to access new and growing demand verticals. That, in and of itself, is a very significant opportunity. But it also allows us to expand our decarbonization offering to our strategic corporate partners. You've heard both David and Rasmus talk about our conviction that the future of offtake will not be government-led, it will be private actor-led. And that is even more true for Power2x than it is for renewable electricity. And so our ability through our Power2x business to meet the needs of our strategic corporate co partners, not only through electrons, but also with molecules, that for us is critical. It also allows us to maximize the value of our assets on an end-to-end -end basis. So for our renewables assets, that means that we can direct the renewable electron to the most value-creating end use, whether that is the grid or its power to X, depending on demand and price signals. It also offers us, um, it also offers us an opportunity to, capture the, to use the captured carbon from our bio plants in Denmark to use that captured biogenic carbon to produce either e-methanol or e-kerosene. And finally, Power2x enables large-scale renewables build-out, both as a significant source of demand for renewables, but also as an alternative route to market for very large-scale renewables where perhaps the grid is insufficient to allow those electrons to go to market or to transport them to market in their current form. And it is this value creation that underpins our ambition for Power2x. So our ambition for this new business, my ambition for this new business, is to catalyze the decarbonization of hard to electrify sectors. And to do this by leveraging Ersted's pioneering DNA to grow a scalable Power2x platform in Europe and North America by 2030. 
Now, that's a very dense ambition statement. So I'm just going to unpick it for you a little bit. I think perhaps the most important word on the slide actually is scalable. So you've seen from my slides, you heard from Mads, this is a sector in its infancy. It truly, it hardly exists today. And so our ambition for this decade is to be ready, is to be ready to meet the demand which we expect at large scale towards the end of this decade and into the 2030s. And we're confident that we will be able to do this, that we'll be able to scale ourselves, that the industry will scale to meet us, and that we'll be able to do that in line with our target returns. And the thing that gives us the most confidence in that is that even today, even in this very early phase of the market, our under construction portfolio across Power 2X and carbon capture, that is within our existing spread to whack requirements. The other important point, the other two important points on this slide, the first is the point about the hard to electrify sectors. We are deliberately looking to electrify as much as we can because we believe that that is the most efficient way to reach a world that runs entirely on green energy, but also because, you, because that way you use hydrogen and ultimately e-fuels only where it is essential, only where it is most value creating. And so our target offtake will be steel, it will be chemicals, it will be shipping for the, for the rest of this decade. And then Europe and North America, we look very much to Europe and to North America for this decade, because that is where we have the existing portfolio of electrons, that is where we have a very, very strong production fundamentals, and also, importantly, very strong demand. And we believe in our ability to be able to install approximately two gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity across Northern Europe and North America by 2030, and also within those markets to continue to develop a pipeline of approximately four gigawatts. And how are we going to do this? Well, we have the right experience and capabilities within Ersted today to scale power to X. First of all, as you've heard extensively this morning, we are a leader in optimizing power generation. Now, why does that matter for me? Why does that matter for power to x Well, because as I said at the beginning, the cost of power is 50% of the outturn cost of green hydrogen. It's about 35% of the outturn cost of e-fuels. And so large scale, low cost, high availability, low risk power, that is critical to any power to x business that is looking to deliver at scale and I know that I can rely on my colleagues to deliver me that. The second thing is that the electrolyzer market itself is in its infancy. And we are very, very accustomed to scaling technology. When we first installed a turbine, it was 0.5 megawatts. Now we install 14 megawatt turbines. We know how to optimize the supply chain as it scales up. We know how to work with it, and we know that we have found value in doing this before and doing it successfully. Thirdly, we're building capabilities in adjacent technologies. Mads has already mentioned our success in the Danish carbon capture and storage tender with Microsoft as our carbon credits offtaker. The capabilities we will build in delivering on our obligations in that tender, they will be critical if we are to deliver both e-methanol and ultimately e-kerosene at scale. Now, the power to x value chain is a long one, and I'll come on in a minute to talk about how we see ourselves playing in that value chain. But critically, to do, to do so successfully, we will need partnerships. We'll need equity partnerships, we'll need offtake partnerships, we'll need supply chain partnerships. And our global ability not only to execute on partnerships, on joint ventures, but actually, as Rasmus said, to really live in them, to really make sure that they create value for ourselves and for our partners over the lifetime of an asset. That is a really important capability for us in this business. And the other critical thing is our ability to sell the molecules that we produce. Now, we've executed more than 55 corporate PPAs globally, and that gives me the confidence that we will be able to deliver 
similar value creation through the sale of molecules. And finally, but perhaps the most important, we have an experienced team, and that experienced team has deep technical capabilities. We have more than 100 people within the Power2x business and within the wider Ersted who are delivering on our pipeline of projects, who have profound expertise in project development and origination, in process engineering, critically in process safety. But we're not going to be developing our Power2x projects in the same way as we develop our offshore wind projects. We're not going to be building the deep technical expertise at every single stage of the value chain that we have done for offshore wind. Given the length and complexity of the Power2x value chain, we are going to focus our capabilities both on those areas where we're already very strong, obviously renewables, also on offtake, and we're going to build the capabilities where we believe that having in-house abilities will either allow us to create asymmetric value, to really reduce risk, or alternatively to have access to critical control points. And so that's the electrolysis, it's the capture and usage of biogenic CO2, and its operations. And for the rest, we expect to continue to work very closely with the supply chain, or we expect to partner. We expect to partner potentially along the value chain, partnering for both for capabilities and also for capital. And we're going to be doing this, as I said, across Europe and North America. And our development approach is very deliberately to focus our development on specific hubs. So in Denmark and in the Netherlands, we are developing, in each case, an up to a gigawatt hub of green hydrogen. In Scandinavia, particularly in Sweden, we will be developing an e-methanol business. And in the US, particularly in Urquhart, we will be delivering e-methanol and towards the end of the decade, also e-ammonia. And the choices of these markets reflect not only the strong production fundamentals, but also the demand that we the existing demand that we see in these markets, and also our market-leading platform of corporate relationships that we are able to leverage here. And to put that into a little bit of context, this is what we're doing in Denmark. De Denmark is, as I said, one of the markets where we're developing a hydrogen hub. And that starts with our h to res project at Avadur, only two megawatts. But we expect this year to take a final investment decision on a 10 megawatt hydrogen project also at Avadur and then relatively rapidly to scale that towards the end of the decade. So that in 2030 or a little bit beyond, we're talking about a gigawatt of project in Denmark, producing whatever the right molecule is at that stage in the market. And that is not something that it's possible to know today. But we will be able to produce hydrogen, methanol, kerosene, as the market requires then. And so finally, I'd like to turn to Flagship One. Now, Flagship One is the e-methanol project we took a final investment decision on in December of last year. As Mad said, it's one of the largest methanol projects in Europe, even though the electrolyzer is only 70 megawatts. It's going to produce approximately 50,000 tons of e-methanol a year. And to put that in context, that is equivalent to decarbonizing one ocean-going large container ship for an entire year. It's a good example of how we're going to exist with our suppliers. So we are acting as the end-to-end -end integrated developer, and we're looking very much to experienced suppliers, Siemens, Topsa, Carbon Clean, to deliver their critical components. And it speaks also to the already existing value creation potential within Power2x, that this is a project where we have seen the offtake prices in, in the discussions that we're having with offtakers increase by approximately 35% since we started having those dialogues in 2022. Finally, also, it's a critical stepping stone for future projects. The ability to actually have steel in the ground, to learn from that steel in the ground, is already delivering very rapid learning loops, which we're benefiting from across the portfolio. 
And so before I hand over to my colleagues, Richard and Virginie, I'd like to conclude by saying we are confident that we will be a market shaper and a significant player in Europe and in the US with this ambition by 2030. And that is because of our ambition married with tangible action. It's because of the value creation we already see today in our portfolio and which we believe we will be able to carry forwards towards 2030. And it is because of the existing capabilities within Ersted as a whole that we have and that we are building and which we believe we can continue to leverage as we scale. So, Richard, thank you very much. Hello and good morning. I'm Richard Hunter. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Ersted. Uh, you could say that I'm responsible for the delivery engine of the company. Um, uh, I'm going to talk today about EPCO and I'll be accompanied by our Chief Procurement Officer, uh, Virginie van der Kotte. A little bit about me. I have over 30 years experience in large, complicated infrastructure and businesses based upon strong engineering and project delivery competencies. Sorry. What I want to do is we will talk about EPCO and we'll do that largely in the context of offshore wind. So first of all, let's talk about where we've come to date. Um, we are the world's leading offshore constructor and operator. As Rasmus has already highlighted, we delivered the world's first offshore wind farm some 30 years ago. 30 years ago. And whether you look at the number of farms constructed, the capacity installed, or indeed the number of farms in operation, we are the number one, with some distance to the number two. Um, and if we look at most developers, they only have a fraction of the experience that we have. Um, and many uh, don't have any experience at all at this point in time. Now, just to move on to what the EPCO acronym stands for, we're going to talk today about four areas of the business. So our engineering and design capabilities, our procurement and supply chain, our construction, delivery and execution capabilities, and of course, how we add value through the operational lifetime of the assets. We have experience across all of these areas, and it's based upon a very strong talent pool that we've built up over time that covers each of the four areas and is also driven by a very strong digital capability that is delivering tools and analytics to our overall business. But what is the context that we're doing in this, doing this in going forward? We are seeing increased complexity in wind farms and within the energy system as a whole. As part of that, they're also being incorporated into much more complex energy systems as we go forward. Early wind farms were relatively simple. A few turbines, a single connection to onshore, um, relatively limited use cases, and operational complexity. Now these are very large. They've incorporated significant offshore assets, many connections to the onshore, and indeed they're of a scale to be strategically relevant at a national level. We're also combining those now with other elements of the energy system. So whether it's uh, storage solutions, offshore offtake, or uh, elements of P2X, as Olivia's highlighted, these are continuing to add to the complexity and the use cases that apply to our projects. So we have the deep competencies around the component level, the package level, but that's not enough. You have to be able to integrate this within the wider energy system and ensure that you're delivering the overall performance of a wind farm in, the, in that energy system. In doing that, um, if you don't have those competencies, any developer that thinks that they can procure um, uh, uh, some turbines, a transmission system, some vessels, and just put them together, will have a great deal of difficulty commissioning into service a compliant, operationally compliant wind farm. We in Ersted have those capabilities. We have the experience to be able to do that and to deliver across the piece. So let's just dive a little bit into those. 
Firstly, our engineering and design competencies. We continue to add value project by project in what we're doing and continuously improve. So we have some examples here. In terms of ground risk assessment, on our Hornsey 3 project, we have achieved something of the order of 50% savings uh, versus previous projects in our geotechnical analysis. If we look at foundations on our Hornsey 2 wind farm, on a light for light basis compared to Hornsey 1, we've saved around 15% of the foundation steel. With our transmission systems and capacity, we've continuously evolved project by project to increase the output that we can achieve. Just looking at one of our recent development projects, by the latest thermal analysis and cable design technology, we've been able to remove the risk of curtailment due to temperature in operation. That means an increase in the maximum capacity output of the wind farm of more than 10%. And we continue to lead the market in terms of our offshore wind farm modeling and performance. We're now achieving supreme accuracy in our predictions of yield across wind farms. And our, our models are entirely based on long range wake effects that are uh, really quite significant now in what we're able to do. Those long, long range wind effects, many of the other developers are only now waking up to the implications of. So with that, we're going to move along and talk about supply chain. And I will hand over to Virginie. Thank you, Richard. I wanted to say good morning, but in fact, it's good afternoon. Let me first introduce myself. My name is uh, Virginie van der Kotte. I'm Chief Procurement Officer. Before joining Ørsted, I was working for uh, Alstom and Bombardier, where I had global leadership positions in procurement, supply chain, and operations. By the way, I don't have a cult. I just have a voice that's easier to remember. I would like to share with you how we work and also uh, why we have a leading position in supply chain. Now, we have a preferred and we are a preferred partner for the supply chain because of our unique value proposition. Let me pause for a moment and let us reflect on what is really happening in the supply chain in our industry. You've all heard that there is a concern of an imbalance between supply and demand. We see many developers running to suppliers to try to secure capacity. On the supplier side, we see that there is a concern that some of the developers will not be able to take off the committed demand. As a result, key top suppliers are becoming very selective with whom they want to work. But Ørsted is always amongst the preferred suppliers. And that is really because of our uh, scale and the pipeline that we have. They also recognize the strong experience that we have to build successfully wind farms in line with our commitments and especially appreciated by the suppliers, is what Richard already has mentioned to you. It's our in-house capability, because in that way, we jointly collaborate with our suppliers on innovation, but also continuously improvement to create and get more value out of our solutions while we're driving and, and uh, committing on sustainability. You've heard Rasmus and David mentioning that we're going to need 17 gigawatt from now up to 2030. So the question is, how do we secure capacity? And it is really a combination of project specific contracts and long term agreements. As a precursor in this industry, we've built strong relationship with our suppliers. In fact, we've grown together in this industry. And through those strategic alliances, we have put ourselves in a favorable position to secure capacity and lock prices for core products. Let me talk you to some of our core products. Turbines and foundations, we have secured more than 50% of our demand, equivalent to, 20, to 10 uh, gigawatt. We also monitor very closely what is happening on steel. 
and we are in a unique position as we have secured 400,000 ton yearly capacity of steel, which is above 80% of what we need up to 2030. We also see an increased demand on cables. And for that reason, we've proactively locked in access of 4,000 kilometers of cables. And through the long-term agreements, we've also secured heavy left vessels for about 10 gigawatts. Again, about 50% of what we need. It is important to highlight that the long-term agreements do not only secure capacity, but also give us the contribution to price certainty. And I'm really pleased with this breadth of strategic alliances that we and our team can give to our project team and development team the certainty and the visibility that no other developers can match. We do not only secure capacity through long-term agreements. We also continuously develop the supply chain to get more access to capacity and um, at competitive costs, of course. And we have shown that we are front runners in developing critical supply chain in our industry. Again, through the unique technical capabilities that we have and the close collaboration to the suppliers. A notable example that I'd like to share is with Cadler, where we have supporting them to, to, on their journey to become a really full transportation and installation vessel suppliers, and on our side also securing more that heavy lift vessel capacity. But we also have track record of accelerating supply chain built out in critical markets. I'd like to share an example in the US where we have facilitated construction of a, a fully American-made uh, vessel, wind installation vessel. And I've been talking a lot about long-term agreements, but it's also the long-term ag agreements and the visibility that we give to our suppliers that allows them to really take the investment to dis decisions to expand uh, production facility. And again, a nice example there is uh, SEA that with giving us, by us giving them the, um, the demand, they have accelerated and taken the investment decision of a new art, um, state of the art facility in, of foundations in the UK. So it is really, it is really the supply chain alliances that we have and that unique ability to continuously develop the supply chain that gives us that flexible flexibility to really secure the capex while we are developing the design of our projects. On the left side of the slide, you have a representation of the uh, capex of a wind farm with the percentage represented, representing the major categories that, uh, that we have. You can also see that per category, we have quite a broad scope of uh, supply base. And as we are designing the further developing and designing the, the projects, we lock in our more detailed contracts so that when we come into FID, we have secured almost all of our capex. There's a small portion maybe a question that you will get, what do we do, do not secure? And there are, we have, of course, some provisions and contingencies that we also add. Our role is not only securing, our focus is not only securing capacity, but we also have a leadership role in catalyzing the sustainability in our industry. In fact, in order to achieve the net zero 24 greenhouse gas emission target, we cannot do it without our suppliers. Therefore, we also feel that we have the responsibility to help our suppliers to accelerate investments in green production. And again, we do that by giving them long-term uh, visibility and also the necessary commitments so that they can do the investment in sustainable production. From an emission perspective, or environmental perspective, steel is the challenge. 
because it represents 50% of the wind farm life cycle greenhouse gas emission. And as my colleague Ingrid already shared in the video, I really would like to highlight again the agreement that Ørsted and Dillinger have signed, which is really a groundbreaking long-term agreement that enables uh, Dillinger to accelerate investment in lower carbon production. And again, as Ingrid mentioned, we will also develop together the first foundation for the uh, offshore industry based on renewable uh, energy, um, or hydrogen and uh, scrap steel. I really like to share that the moment of signing that agreement is a proud moment that I will never forget in my career because it's a really strong contribution to the decarbonization of our industry. To conclude, I'd like to re-emphasize that we use and we leverage our leadership position to secure capacity on competitive terms and to ensure that we can deliver on our projects. Thank you and over to you, Richard. Thank you, Virginie. Uh, so let's now talk about our construction projects and some of the challenges that we face when we're doing those and how we overcome them. Now, we all know that COVID-19 posed unique challenges in so many ways. Uh, and I'm going to look here at uh, the two major farms that we had under construction during that period. If we turn to Hornsey 2, and Mads has already mentioned it, we faced very significant lockdowns and spikes during our main installation season and throughout the commissioning period. In addition, uh, the in-time delivery from our worldwide supply chain to this had many logistical challenges due to COVID. Despite all of that, we were able to commission with only two months delay. Turning to Greater Changhua 1 and 2A, again, COVID had even more extreme impacts here with more than one year of effective lockdown of installation. Um, we were not at times able to bring workforce into Taiwan and even when you could, there was very extensive quarantine periods and we had difficulties, exchange, difficulties exchanging crews on vessels. Despite all of that, we have 97 turbines installed, which is more than any of the comparators. And yes, with one year delay, that's still only about half what other developers have seen. But let's put those unique challenges also into the context of our overall portfolio. We have an unparalleled track record of delivering projects on time and to budget. Even with Hornsey 2 and Changhua 1 and 2A, these projects are still adding value to our business. Looking forward, uh, the current market constraints and the extreme period we've seen in the last 12 months has had some impact in our ongoing projects. But by contracting early and by uh, partnering with the supply chain, as Virginia has set out, we've been able to mitigate and manage the significant proportion of that. Moving from construction, we obviously go into operation. We get the maximum output from any given wind farm. Looking here, you can see that we continue to increase the share that we are self-operating within the industry, and that is continuing to deliver significant value to the wider business. Here you can see in terms of availability, which clearly higher availability results in more output and revenue, and in terms of the cost of our operational activities. So we're driving this using our uh, significant modeling capabilities, our advanced analytics, which are continuously evolving, um, and we're able to harness innovation and synergies across our portfolio to continue to drive value in our ongoing operational activities. Let's look in a little more detail at that. So as turbine sizes have continued to increase, as the industry matures, and as we've built our operational experience, we're seeing continuous optimization of operating costs. So looking at the latest 11 megawatt generation of turbines, we don't expect to use any more hours to service these than we do for the six megawatt generation. We've increased automation and digital activities utilizing drones and robots uh, to do a significant proportion of our inspections. Not only is this driving efficiency, it means we have far fewer manual activities within confined and challenged spaces within a turbine. And of course, with that world leading install base of wind farms in operation, coupled with the hub structure that we use around our core markets, 
we're able to realize significant synergies across the operating portfolio in things like logistics, warehouses, etc. All continuing to drive the market leadership in terms of both the operational cost and, as we referred, referred to earlier, the actual performance of the wind farm. So in summary, we have the unrivaled experience and capabilities to execute the energy systems of the future. The engineering competencies, the supplier relationships and procurement methodologies, uh, the best in class delivery of projects, um, and of course that unique operational experience across a very wide installed base. And we're able to combine that with a comprehensive understanding of what it takes to commission a wind farm into, into operation against all of the technical and market requirements that exist, and all while continuing to incorporate sustainability. We are best placed to deliver these assets into service on time and to budget. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And we will now go to a short video hosted by our Head of Strategy and Innovation, Varun. At Orsted, we believe leading on innovation is key to leading the world toward a future powered entirely by green energy. Innovation gives us an edge in our core offshore wind business. And we're also investing in breakthroughs to integrate even higher penetrations of renewables into the global energy system and decarbonize the world economy. At any given moment, Orsted scientists and engineers are incubating more than 100 R&D projects that strengthen our competitive advantage. For example, we've designed, built, and patented the industry's first unmanned survey vessel, which uses onboard LIDAR to accurately predict offshore wind generation at prospective sites. Right now, it's 210 kilometers off the Danish coast in the North Sea. It's withstood storm waves of over nine meters and can spend a year out at sea, remotely operated from shore. In each of the next five months, we'll build a new vessel, and the new vessels will survey waters over 300 meters deep to scope out the best sites for floating offshore wind, a key innovation priority for Orsted. Beyond in-house R&D, we're actively building partnerships and investing in the thriving global cleantech ecosystem, spanning cutting-edge university research to innovative startups. Take our Picasso project with Oxford University. We've long been the industry leader at designing the most efficient monopile foundations for offshore wind turbines, using less steel while ensuring reliable operation. For two decades, we've managed to do more with less, while our turbines have grown larger and more powerful. If not for our design breakthroughs, our foundations would be 500 tons heavier and have to embed five meters deeper into the seabed. Now, we've partnered with leading Oxford researchers to prolong this trend. We've developed an unprecedented understanding of the cyclic stresses foundations face across different soils, so we can use cost-effective monopiles even as turbines grow and water depths increase. Outside of academia, we've invested in dozens of disruptive startup technology companies. For example, take one of our portfolio companies, Spore, which powers data collection on bird flights near offshore wind farms. We've deployed Spore at two sites, harnessing sensors and AI to accurately track birds, and in the process, demonstrating that the risks of collision are already low. Like Spore, innovative startups around the world look to bring on Orsted as a strategic partner. So we launched the Propel program to capitalize on this strong interest. In our most recent round, we selected just eight out of over 150 companies that pitched us technologies from storing green power to decarbonizing industry. Renewable energy will be the centerpiece of a clean energy transition but our technology leadership extends beyond wind generation. Just last month, the Danish Energy Agency awarded Orsted a landmark contract for our carbon capture and sequestration Kalundborg hub. We'll capture biogenic carbon dioxide from our Danish combined heat and power plants and store over 400,000 tons of CO2 every year in the Norwegian North Sea. And in one of the largest carbon removal offtake agreements by volume in the world, we've joined forces with Microsoft, which has agreed to purchase nearly 3 million tons of durable, high quality carbon dioxide removals, a clear demand signal to scale up this emerging technology. Now, a key focus area of our innovation initiatives is excellence in digital technologies and artificial intelligence. We're already developing a suite of powerful capabilities unlocked by generative AI, 
and building on our track record of pioneering AI advances. Take operations. Orsted sends drones down into the confined spaces of our offshore wind turbines below the waterline to monitor corrosion and structural integrity. Our drones take thousands of pictures, and our in-house AI models geolocate and stitch the images together to automatically detect corrosion using deep learning neural networks. We also deploy drones and AI to inspect the insides and outsides of our turbine blades. These digital advances keep our wind farm availability at industry-leading levels, and we can cut down on the cost, time, and risk of sending manned crews out to sea. For every business function, Orsted's built a dedicated digital laboratory, which creates cutting-edge tools like our smart bidding application, which harnesses AI for advanced weather prediction and real-time power trading. Indeed, the era of predictable power prices is behind us as the energy transition accelerates. With more renewables surging onto the grid, Orsted is proactively investing in the technologies we'll need to store and use the green electricity we generate. We're already a leader in deploying energy storage at massive scale, like our 1200 megawatt hour battery at our US 11 mile project. But we're also investing in long duration energy storage through partnerships with Energy Dome and High View Power. Aside from storage, we've signed an MOU to locate high-performance computing data centers exclusively for artificial intelligence alongside our U.S. wind farms. As AI training and inference drive an explosion in the demand for computing, Orsted will be a leader in powering innovative end uses that have the flexibility to use green electricity when we produce it. Finally, we're pioneering P2X as a flexibility solution that produces clean fuels from green electricity. We've partnered with New Lab, a cutting edge technology incubator in the historic Brooklyn Navy Yard. There, we're building the world's first floating P2X R&D platform, comprising a modular architecture to test and demonstrate emerging technologies to produce, store, and use green fuels. And back in Europe, our Project Oyster brings us full circle back to our core as the world's offshore wind leader. With funding from the European Union, we're demonstrating a combined wind turbine and electrolyzer system for offshore hydrogen production. Leadership is earned, and we don't take ours for granted. As the global energy system transforms, Orsted will remain at its forefront. We're not waiting for the future. We're inventing it. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to, uh, to see all of you here today. I'm uh, Daniel Leop, uh, the group CFO, and I've been with the company for uh, almost 15 years. I will be taking you through the financials, an area where we have seen uh, great progress uh, despite the, the challenging macroeconomic environment that, uh, that we are in right now. If we, uh, if we look at some of the, the key metrics that we, uh, that we put out in connection with our last Capital Markets Day, we are still on track to deliver, delivering on the roughly 50 gigawatt of capacity in 2030. And yes, we have seen that uh, costs are going up, but despite that, we are still seeing a meaningful outperformance on our ROSI and uh, EBDA for the business plan period uh, uh, we guided on up until 2027. So, uh, so, so what's driving this outperformance? Um, let's start by taking a look at our EBDA up until 2027, where we've seen a significant uh, upside of roughly 20% compared to what we were looking at at the last capital market state. The key drivers for that is, uh, is first and foremost the, the very balanced portfolio that we have with a very large degree of inflation indexed revenue contracts, uh, which is benefiting a lot from the inflationary environment that, uh, that we are in. Then we've been engaging heavily with uh, uh, key stakeholders and regulators, meaning that we've also seen good progress in the, in the support that we are getting from that side. I think the Polish changes is a good example of that. 
the passback in the US, and of course the General uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act benefits that, uh, that, uh, that we are seeing. And as David said earlier, we are assuming that we will be able to secure uh, uh, at least 40% ITC, either through uh, the, the energy community adder or the domestic content adder. And then we are also seeing uh, um, that the, uh, the, the mix of, uh, of uh, merchant exposure that we have in our portfolio, our ability to, to manage that through corporate PBAs at higher levels, but of course also the upside that we have from the open merchant exposure also is a, is a benefit in, uh, when we're looking at, uh, at the numbers in, in this period. This increase is, a, uh, is an increase that we have a good visibility on, as 90% of that earning in 2027 is from assets in operation, under construction, or from the awarded portfolio. Uh, and this is despite the fact that we're actually seeing a little bit of uh, a reduction in the net generating capacity over that period. Again, back to the fact that, for example, Baltica 3 is not included in this period anymore. So EBDA, EBDA up with roughly 20%, and our gross investments uh, are up with less than half of that. So below 10% increase we see on our gross investments. We've seen an impact from the general cost inflation in this period, adding up to roughly 15% of cost increase, a little more than uh, uh, 50 billion uh, DKK. But then we've also, due to our strict focus on maximizing value in our projects, also seen that there are some projects that we are now reconfiguring and therefore are not in this period anymore. So there's roughly one gigawatt less assumed in this period, which roughly equates to, uh, to Baltica 3. So EBDA up with 20%, our gross investments up with less than 10%, which of course means that, uh, that our ROSI is also looking better in, in that period. Um, we are looking into a average ROSI for that period of roughly 15%, mainly driven by the increasing EBDA, but we're actually also seeing that our capital employed is going down in that period compared to last capital markets day, which is again pulling the ROSI up. And that's through our uh, uh, hedge liability management uh, and also due to the fact that we are seeing uh, uh, more tax equity investments given the, uh, the increased tax credits that we'll be able to get through the Inflation Reduction uh, Act. And then just a reminder, when we talk about ROSI and put out ROSI targets, we include a lot of capex for the projects that we will be constructing in that same period, meaning that you have a lot of capex in that period that is basically not generating any earnings. So if you adjusted for all of that and only looked at the ROSI for, for the operating portfolio, you would have a return on capital employed of roughly 18%. If we then take a, a, a look at the projects that we have matured towards operation since the last CMD, we have uh, divided it into two buckets. So the first bucket is the European and APAC projects, and then we have the US projects in the, uh, in the other bucket. Across these two buckets, we are seeing that IRRs are going up. In, uh, in, U in Europe and the APAC bucket, we are seeing that IRRs are going up due to the inflation adjustments, due to uh, our regulatory engagements and the changes that are coming out of that and also our ability to, to manage the, the merchant elements in these projects. Uh, and we've seen that uh, our risk-free rate, the one that we use in our WAC, has gone up with more than 250 basis points over that two-year period. And despite that, we still have a 
very healthy value creation in that portfolio of projects where the weighted average spread to WAG is within our guided range of the 150 to 300 basis points on a life cycle level. As Rasmus said earlier, Horn C3 is also in this bucket, and here value is not where we want it to be, but we believe that through uh, maturing the key value levers that we can progress it towards our, uh, our uh, range of 150 to 300 basis points. Then we have the, the US projects um, where the life cycle uh, spread to WAG is roughly neutral. Um, and that, of course, uh, hurts my uh, value creation uh, hard that, uh, that we are in such a situation. Uh, but we have built a really strong foundation that will create a lot of value for us in the future through the connections that we've made with the regulators, through the infrastructure that we are sitting on, through the scale benefits and synergies that we will get for future projects. So the most rational way to look at this going forward is on a forward-looking basis. And that is only on these near-term projects that has been hit by a lot of challenges over the last couple of years. And if you take that perspective, the rational uh, uh, decision is to progress these projects as we expect that the uh, additional investments that we will be putting in to these projects will be aligned with our value creation targets of the 150 to 300 basis points. When we then uh, look into new auctions and tenders, we stay committed to our industry-leading return target of the 150 to 300 basis points on a life cycle basis, fully cost-loaded, unlevered. Remember, this is a very ambitious target that we are putting on ourselves, both due to the level, but also due to how we calculate this, because we include all DAVIX cost, all acquisition cost, fully allocate all of our overhead, we don't include any divestment gains, and we don't include any uh, uh, trading optimization gains in these numbers. And that is why this is an industry-leading return requirement. And then you can ask, okay, why do you set it so high? Are you not missing out on opportunities? Yes, we might miss out on opportunities, but we want to make sure that we get the right projects with the best value creation. And this is why we have this focus. So the investment program up until 2030 that we will be applying this framework on uh, is an investment program of roughly 475 billion Danish up until 2030. So we are now extending our business plan period up until 2030 in order to make it more simple with all of the metrics that we have out there to align them more towards 2030. The lion's share of our investments will continue to go into offshore wind, uh, roughly 70%. This is where we see the biggest value creating growth for our company, and this is also where we have the largest competitive edge. In onshore, we continue to see a lot of uh, great value creation opportunities, very much helped lately by the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, uh, the growing regulatory support in Europe, uh, but also due to the fact that onshore has a much faster time to market than what we are exampling seeing in, in offshore, uh, and therefore uh, uh, de-risking the, the capex risk in the onshore business. And then we are allocating roughly 5% of our capital to, you can say, the hopefully the, the future of uh, of Ørsted. We are taking a balanced approach to P2X, making sure that we don't uh, uh, jump into the deep end, but we will be building our capabilities over the next uh, 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 couple of, of years and, uh, and decades in, in this area. And we think it's a balanced entry to allocate roughly 5% of our capital to, uh, to that area. 
if we dig a little bit into the maturity profile of our capex and, and zoom in on the offshore part, uh, we will be spending roughly 335 billion towards 2030 on, uh, on, on, on offshore. Roughly half of that will be spent on the assets that we already have under construction uh, and on the near-term awarded portfolio. And we have a very high cost visibility on uh, that part of CapEx as roughly 90% of that CapEx is, uh, is contracted. If we then move on to uh, how will we find the sources to make all of these investments, then we will see that the operating cash flow continues to be the foundation of uh, our sources, accounting for 40%. Uh, and that, of course, gives a lot of comfort, given that 80% of our earnings is coming from uh, uh, regulated and long-term contracted earnings on a average horizon of 16 years. So we have a lot of visibility on the key element of the sources. Then the farm down model will continue to be a key element of funding for us. Uh, tax equity, roughly 15%. And then we expect to increase our net debt with roughly uh, 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 15% of, 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 of the sources that will be going into, into these uh, uh, investments. On the farm downs, we have an unrivaled track record. We basically invented the farm down model within offshore, and it's something that we've been doing for more than a decade. We raised 200 billion DKK through the farm down model, and made more than 20 farm downs. Last year, where we had a, a more volatile, tumultuous financial market, we were able to raise 30 billion DKK from, uh, from three uh, farm downs at NPV retentions above 100%. In our business plan towards 2030, we are assuming uh, 20 billion in proceeds every year from the farm down model. So it's significantly less than what we raised last year. And we are in the market right now with several transactions. We continue, as we always have, see a lot of demand and we see good prices. So this is an assumption that we are very comfortable with. We are assuming we expect to be able to farm down at NPV retentions still at around 100%. Uh, in PV retention, but we of course put in a little bit of conservatism when we add the proceeds into our business plan. The other key funding model is of course our centralized financing model when it comes to uh, debt. Uh, we fund uh, our projects on our balance sheet, which gives us a lot of flexibility and also very competitive terms. We are the leading issuer of green bonds, and as of today, we are also uh, the first to start leading the blue bond financing market, um, a, an area that we believe will unlock a lot of uh, uh, capital in the future. So we are happy to take the first step, still on good terms, to take on the learnings and start educating the market on this so that we continue to get competitive financing, which we have today, which we will expect to see also in the future. We have a very prudent approach to our liquidity management, and we uh, use undrawn committed facilities to back that up, which significantly lowers the cost in order to have that strong liquidity balance that we have of roughly 100 billion uh, DKK. And then we have access to a wide range of financing sources being uh, both hybrids, senior bonds, uh, export credit, supranationals, and so on. Uh, and that ensure that we have good terms and good pricing whenever we go to the market. 
we have the lowest refinancing risk in the in the industry. Our uh, current debt portfolio has an average maturity of more than 10 years, which of course gives us a lot of comfort on the uh, on the rate exposure that we are sitting with. And we have deep access to uh, the capital markets on long dated issuance, and we continue to see a lot of demand, more demand than what we see in our peers, uh, over subscription of uh, 3.6 times in the last uh, many uh, issuance that we've made, and we continue to see very low new issue premiums on the debt that we raise. Then we also have a dividend policy today that uh, increases yearly with a high single digit up until 2025. And we are getting close to that period. With the business plan that we are uh, putting forward today, we want to extend that dividend period up until 2030. So from 2026 up until 2030, you will have very good visibility on the dividends and they will be growing with a mid-single digit every year up until 2030. We know that dividends are important for many of our investors, and we also think it's a, it's a sign of discipline that we are handing back some of the earnings that we are making. With this dividend, we are paying out over that period roughly 30% of our Uh, of our earnings and the capital that we have at hand we will be investing roughly 85% of that into value creating opportunities and 15% of that we will be handing back to all of you our investors and we think that's a quite good balance considering all of the opportunities that we have and we can make a dividend policy that far out because we have that visibility on our earnings and we have a strong balance sheet. Today we have a quite significant headroom uh, on our FFO to, to net debt. Uh, we are above 40%. We of course over time want to uh, you fully utilize our capital structure and we will see investments go up over the coming years, meaning that we will see our capital structure coming down. Uh, but we have put in conservatism and uh, we are at roughly 30% FFO to net debt, where we have a target of roughly 25%. We remain committed to our triple B, triple B plus rating. Uh, we will uh, deliver on our dividend policy and of course committed to that. And we don't need any new equity in order to deliver on this business plan is fully self-funded. So how will our earnings grow towards 2030? We are looking into an earnings growth of uh, roughly 13 to 14% on EBDA, getting us to a range of roughly 50 to 55 billion DKK in EBDA in 2030. Again, in order to simplify things, we've decided to change from the previous long-term earnings guidance where it was uh, assets in offshore and onshore assets in operations. We've changed that to group EBDA, excluding new partnerships, so that it basically aligns with our one-year financial EBITDA guidance. Had we kept the old method, you would have seen roughly the same Uh, uh, growth in our earnings ending up roughly the same place because what we are now adding in is the earnings from P2X, bioenergy and others and a little bit of uh, you can say existing uh, construction agreement gains at that point in time uh, but which will be largely netted out by then also including all of our overhead and all of our DVEX of roughly five billion DKK. So there is a net positive impact from this of a couple of uh, billion DKK. So it's nothing that changes the, the overall metrics uh, in this. And that is, this is a growth that we have 
very good visibility on as 75% of that EBDA is coming from assets uh, operating, assets under construction and from our awarded portfolio. And it's a net capacity of 25 gigawatt that's delivering this. And that EBDA will also help support our return on capital, where we will expect an average ROSI of 14% over that period, very much driven by all of the, the assets that will be coming into, uh, into operation. As you will see, the ROSI for this period is a little bit lower than for the period up until 2027. Uh, two key factors driving that we are, as uh, the years go by, we are assuming a power price that goes down actually throughout the entire period. From 2027 until 2030, we assume that the power prices decrease with roughly 20%. So that's, of course, something that is dragging the number down. And then, of course, as we invest more and more, uh, uh, it will, of course, uh, uh, you can say dilute some of the historic very good return on capital projects that we have in, uh, in, in our portfolio, some of the, the very high CFD uh, projects that we have in, uh, in the UK. So what, what gives us comfort that we can deliver on this? Well, we have a strong focus on risk management and we are uh, uh, managing all of our financial exposures, but there are three key areas that I would uh, like to go into. One thing is uh, our prioritization of inflation indexation. Roughly 50% of our earnings has this inflation, uh, uh, sorry, revenue has this inflation indexation. Uh, and it's long-term contracted. Then we have 30% uh, coming from, again, long-term contracted revenue, but fixed nominal. This is mainly from the US portfolio and from Taiwan. And then we have 20% remaining merchant exposure, which in our mind gives a good balance between merchant and the highly regulated earnings. And if we go into the inflation uh, adjusted uh, contracts, revenue contracts that, that we have. This is something that we incentivize in the business as we see it as a very good protection against cost inflations uh, and uh, increasing funding costs. And actually, if you look at all of the revenue contracts that we have today with the inflation indexation uh, and look at how have they increased in value nominal value since our last capital markets day. The increase is 65 billion. And that is not a future value. That is mm, uh, the lion's share of that comes from the actual inflation that we've since, seen since the last capital markets day up until today. So this basically more than outweighs the cost inflation that I showed you earlier on gross investments. And then in the future, this inflation protection uh, uh, can, can counterweight uh, changes in the rate environment if that is driven by inflation. We give a relief in our WAC to projects with a inflation protection, again, to incentivize that as we see lower risk in those projects. And then we very much promote inflation protection in our dialogue with regulators where we have been very successful in Poland and also Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts, and expectedly many more of the auctions to, uh, to come. And this is one of the key areas um, that uh, reduces risk in our business. So that is why we spend so much time with regulators ensuring that they understand this. Then as I showed before, we had we have roughly 30% of our revenue coming from uh, long-term fixed nominal contracts, which of course exposes us towards interest uh, rate increases. And how we think about that is that we have a, a fixed rate, long-term fixed rate uh, debt portfolio, 
and that roughly matches the fixed nominal exposure that we have from our assets in, in operations and under construction. And then we have an awarded portfolio that we are maturing towards funding. Here we are using interest rate swaps in order to provide some protection against the uh, interest rate exposure that we have on, on, on that part. And we are roughly 25% covered, and you will see that increase as many of these projects mature even more. And then we have the, the merchant part. On average, towards 2030, uh, it's only 20% of our earnings that comes from uh, the merchant power exposure, 80% from the long-term contracted earnings. In our mind, that creates a really good balance, and it's a good protection against the wrong ray risk, meaning that when uh, uh, wind is not blowing too much, we have low production impacting our regulated earnings, you would often see that power prices then go up, giving us a protection of the, the steady base of our, of our earnings. And we are getting this better natural balance through the new hedging framework that we have talked about at uh, previous uh, earnings calls. It will help reduce the, the downside uh, 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 risk in the framework with more than 20% on our earnings, reduce collateral with more than 50%, and we will see more than a 50% reduction of the IFIs 9 effects that we've also unfortunately had to spend a lot of time on uh, over, over the last uh, uh, year. And we will see significantly fewer months where we are, are, are overhedged. So what we, uh, what we want to deliver is, uh, is the roughly 50 gigawatt of installed value creating capacity without uh, or self-funded without any new equity. We will uphold our industry leading return requirement of 150 to 300 basis points on a fully cost loaded life cycle perspective. We have a strong uh, risk uh, proposition with a lot of earnings coming from inflation indexation and a good coverage of our interest rate risk through our debt portfolio and interest rate swaps. We see a very good growth towards 2030 of 13 to 14 percent in our EBDA and a ROSI of 14 percent and then we are extending our dividend policy until 2030. So a very attractive risk return profile uh, with a very financially disciplined uh, uh, growth ahead of us. Thanks a lot for, uh, for that. And uh, I will now hand over to Mass to, uh, to wrap up. Yes, thank you very much for hanging in there. Uh, I'm sure it's been a pretty intense three hours for all of you with lots and lots of information. Uh, we've been really looking forward to sharing all of that with you. And now we really, really look forward to getting your questions and some real uh, dialogue. But before we go there, uh, allow me just to make sort of the almost impossible task of, uh, of wrapping up three hours into sort of just one slide of key messages. Uh, but maybe most importantly, now you've gotten the opportunity to meet also uh, many, not all of, but many of my senior leadership colleagues, the rest are in the room, but hopefully this gives you also an impression of, uh, of people being very close to the subject matters that we do indeed work with on a daily basis. Now, the most important thing we've been trying to tell you over the last three hours is by 2030, we will be the world's leading green energy major. We will be deploying our position and our unique capabilities to be one of the largest electricity producers in the renewable space at all. We will also very, very importantly be deploying the potential of our total portfolio of well over 100 gigawatts combined with a very strict financial discipline and focus on value creation to ensure that we firmly commit to and deliver 
on our industry leading 150 to 300 basis points spread to WAC. We will be deploying 475 billion, almost half a trillion DKK into delivering approximately 50 gigawatts of operational capacity by 2030. And even though that is largely unchanged, that is still one of the most ambitious build out plans at all in our industry. We are firmly committing to and upholding our targets to stay and strengthen our position as a global offshore leader, extremely important to us, whilst at the same time continuing the journey to be a really strong and significant player in onshore in the chosen regions and be a market shaper in power to x We will ensure that we do all of this while delivering very strongly on our financial results. Daniel just shared it. 13 to 40% growth in our operational earnings, around 14% return on capital, and bear in mind with a very high visibility to the earnings that we actually and cash flows we have ahead of us. Strategically very important that these integrated renewable solutions that we can deliver and will deliver, combined with our ability to innovate new decarbonization solutions with our corporate customers, will be a key strategic leg on our journey going forward in all regions, but not least also in the European region, as Rasmus told you about. We are now extending um, our dividend commitment with a continued growth in dividends, whilst not compromising the strength of our balance sheet with a fully funded plan and ensuring that we uphold and protect our credit rating. And last but not least, we are very determined and dedicated to uphold and continue to shape a global sustainability leadership, which is not something we do on the side. It is who we are. It is what we commit to. It is what we shape. So with that, uh, I invite my colleagues on stage to take your questions. We will just do a very quick reset up here with some tables. But otherwise, we really look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. All right, we are now ready for the uh, Q&A. And I want to remind, uh, remind everyone that is uh, with us here at the Science Museum that if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. And then either uh, Valdemar or Sabine will reach you with a microphone. Uh, please state your name and company before asking a question. And please respect only one question at a time so we ensure we can uh, fill out the crowd. If you participate via the live stream uh, or want to have a question without attribution, write an email to, uh, to ir at orsted.com and then I, I will have it uh, sent to my uh, screen. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. <laughs> 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 and I think we have over uh, with Valdemar. Oh, fab. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. No, hello. No, no, please, no, just, uh, no, no, we need please the microphone. use the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. We hear there you. You go. Okay, thank you. I've won the question lottery. Um, I, I guess this is a, it's a pretty big question, and I'm sorry to ask such a narrow financial question after such a comprehensive presentation. But on the capital raise, clearly it's a self-funded plan. Are you saying anything about future capital raise uh, intentions, though? Should we assume this is basically a, effectively a lock-up now until your next CMD? where you perhaps revisit targets in one or two years' time, and then we're not going to have any capital raise until then. Thank you. I think, I think what we can firmly say is that we have a plan now, and that is the plan we believe in, and that is fully funded. And we continue to believe this is a very ambitious plan, and we are very confident in our ability to deliver that with the current capital structure that we have.
Hi, uh, Deepa Venkatesh from, from Bernstein. So my uh, question is, uh, we do see quite a difference in the way you're looking at Hornsey 3 versus the U.S. under construction portfolio, when on the face of it, the U.S. projects do have a higher uh, offtake price. And then, you know, even with the inflation adjustment, the U.K. one looks challenging. So could you explain what's driving your almost, uh, you know, maybe a differential approach between the UK and the US. If you could maybe ask me if you could start by commenting specifically on Hornsey 3. Absolutely. Um, the reason we are confident in the, in the value creation uh, on Hornsey 3 is because of uh, partly the levers on revenue that we are looking at now. It is uh, the robustness that we are starting to see on CapEx. Uh, and uh, it is also uh, very much, as I talked about, the scale uh, of the project. Specifically on the revenue uh, levers, and what makes me confident saying that uh, I'm firmly convinced that we will over time progress uh, towards our guided range, which is, uh, you can say, different uh, than what we are saying uh, in the US, since we are talking life cycle here is uh, in particular the flexibility around the CFD. So we can, we can do corporate PPAs uh, up to 25% uh, of the entire uh, wind farm if we'd like. Um, we can also decide to keep that merchant. We are working on uh, storage, also on revenue in connection with the onshore substation. We are working on behind the meter uh, initiatives also on revenue. So we basically see a range of levers that makes me confident saying what I am. And then maybe to, to add, uh, remember also that we are penalizing the US projects for having the fixed nominal revenue structure, which again then when you compare them gives a benefit to, to a Horn C3 project. Maybe just one comment for me as well. I mean, the US projects were bid and won many years ago. The Horn C3 project was just bid and won last year. So we've had more time for the inflation and, and uh, interest rate adjustments to affect our projects. And of course, it's a new market. And while many of the things that have impacted us are generic global things which just happen to be affecting our large US portfolio, there are sh for sure some um, bespoke issues in the US that have you know, led to some of the cost increases, et cetera. So. Oh. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon. Uh, Louis Bougeard from Odo BHF. So my question would be the following. I think that you mentioned in your presentation uh, that um, you uh, you take some uh, relief on the work computation, notably on the basis of uh, inflationary contracts. Could you elaborate a little bit on this topic and maybe give uh, an idea of the magnitude of the kind of relief that you could take in these assumptions? No, I don't want to give you a, a specific number because that's, of course, something that is uh, a bit sensitive also when we are bidding into auctions, knowing what kind of relief that we, that we give. But again, if you look up in, 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 in most academia and how they view inflation uh, and how it protects projects, I think you would get a, get, get a pretty good idea. Christian Tony, uh, SCP. Um, David, in your presentation, you mentioned that the three near-term U.S. projects uh, do actually not qualify for the 40% ITC as, as current guidance stands. Uh, so what need to happen for, for the 40% to be reached? And does that also mean that when you say that they are uh, value neutral right now, it's actually under the assumption that, that future guidance supports this uplift? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, first, to clarify the, the second part of your question, yes, the value neutral from a life cycle return standpoint does assume a 40% ITC across all three projects. Right now, we have preliminary guidance on these two extra bonus ITCs, 10% each. Um, and given that preliminary guidance, not all three projects qualify for, for 40%. But we've been in discussions with, with uh, very senior people in Washington, D.C., in the White House, um, and have expressed the, the, you know, they understand the challenges that these projects have, and they also recognize, you know, Orsted's leadership in starting 
to build this industry in the US. And we believe that confidently that as we as they come out with their final guidance that we can get these projects to qualify for one or the other or potentially both of these um, extra 10% ITC bonuses. So. Yeah, hi, it's Peter Bischtiger from Bank of America here. Thank you very much for your presentations today. Uh, I was particularly interested in the power to x stuff. I think that we haven't heard that much detail about it before. But I was wondering, in your 2030 targets with the two gigawatts, what assumptions have you made, or, or indeed what assumptions do you need regarding government support mechanisms, tax credits, um, some sort of uh, subsidy, or, or are those targets based on a fully commercial uh, uh, arrangement? So we'd be very interested to hear a little bit about how the economics work from that perspective. Thank you. So the two gigawatts that we're looking at, we expect that to be, broadly speaking, evenly split between Europe and the United States. Um, of course, in the United States, the projects will benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, in Europe, we expect them to be able to benefit from en <laughs> all sorts of things, apparently. No, from um, any one of the sort of patchwork of support mechanisms that Europe is offering, whether that's the EU Innovation Fund. We already have IPSI funding for both for the early phases of both the Dutch and the Danish projects in our portfolio, and also expect to put projects into the European Hydrogen Bank auctions as and when those start. So there is significant public funding available um, and we will be looking to tap it to the extent possible, along with other pools of capital as those become available. And we do see significant interest in, um, in investing in this relatively new sector from third parties as well. Uh, hi, it's Sam Airy here from UVS. Thanks so much for the presentation. I thought it was excellent. Um, and I think I want to ask a question about the financial equation, because obviously you've done some magic today to make uh, you know, sources and uses of cash all add up. So well done, Daniel. And my, my question is for you, uh, particularly on the farm down element of the plan. I suppose it's, uh, it's, it's great news, but a little bit surprising that you're so comfortable with, I think you said, 20 billion proceeds from farm downs every year through the rest of the decade when obviously some of the projects are a bit challenged and rates have gone up. So can you tell us in aggregate, what is the MPV to CapEx assumption that you have on your farm downs to get those uh, 20 billion proceeds every year through the plan? Yeah, thanks for the, the question, Sam. Remember, we've been in this market for more than a decade. We have deep relationships with all of the key infrastructure investors and pension funds, and they are very hungry to get ownership in these assets. And we get that confirmed year over year over year. And as I said, we are very active in the market right now and we see good demand. So we have no reason to believe that we can't uh, uh, continue with that. On the NPV to, to CapEx multiple, um, again, it's very project by project specific. Uh, so it's a very difficult multiple to give. In essence, what ends up being the the, the gain that you make depends on what is the value creation spread on top of the WAC for the individual uh, uh, project as we are seeking to get this 100% NPV retention. Uh, meaning that, for example, on a Horn C3 project where we know we are looking into a higher spread to WAC compared to the US near-term portfolio, you would then see a, a higher gain on a Horn C3 project compared to the near-term offshore uh, uh, US projects. But the level of the WAC doesn't de uh, define whether it makes sense to make the divestment or not. If we can crystallize value up front at 100% NPV retention, basically retaining all of the NPV uh, and go out and reinvest that into 150 to 300 basis points, um, then, then it makes sense. Then it's a value-creating uh, circle that we've 
uh, that, that we've created, and we are confident that we can continue to do that. Thank you. Uh, Rob Pauline from Morgan Stanley. Um, the focus on value creation is um, very clear and I think uh, comprehended by everyone. Um, and I'd just like to ask within that, the 28 gigawatts installed target for offshore wind by 2030, um, you've been quite clear if projects do not stack up, and you mentioned a few, you would walk away from them, which seems very reasonable. And so the question is, how many gigawatts can you walk away from and still get to that 28 gigawatts? And should be the message, which I think was there, but let's clarify, um, is that 28 gigawatts therefore a minimum that you will deliver? Because you could, of course, turn these projects around and win several of the auctions upcoming. Thank you very much. Th thanks a lot, Rob. Th this is the plan that we have now with the 28 uh, gigawatts of offshore is the best balance focusing on value creation across all the technologies that we have. Right now, like we said previously, our plan was around 30 gigawatts. Now we're saying 28. And that is, of course, in light of not least, you will also have noticed the, the variation in what, what especially uh, uh, Erasmus and David said, that we have quite a bit of vari regional variation. And that is simply because we want to ensure that we have the flexibility in our portfolio. We are reconfiguring a couple of projects right now, which means that right now that timeline is not known which essentially is a key reason uh, for, for us also bringing that down. It may well be that we can still construct those by 2030, but right now we are not taking that assumption. So we want to say offshore has gone through a challenging period. We are firmly convinced and, and, and sure that we can continue to create value within our guided range in the future on the future projects. And we could surely grow faster, but right now the balance that we, that we strike with the 28 is something we feel very confident that we can deliver uh, with, with the value creation. And then we, we, we right now assume that we won't change that plan. But should that happen, there will especially the flexibility between the regions could of course happen. So that's why David said three to five. But if, for example, if we come out with strongly value creating winds, which it would be in both New York 3 and in Rhode Island, we would then have a situation where we would say, does that need a rebalancing to Europe, or how do we do that? That's the flexibility we need to have in our plan. But right now, this is the best estimate we have, and it's the best plan that we have at hand with exactly the 28. Hi, uh, Amit Farman from Jefferies. Thank you for the presentation and all the details on the business plan. My question is actually on the um, awarded projects in Europe. Can you give us some further granularity on where do you see the IRR to WAC spread on the three awarded projects in, in Europe? And how much visibility do you have on that from today's perspective, which I presume is a function of how much capex you have locked in and, and the regulatory and mitigation factors? Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. I, of course, understand exactly where you are coming from. Um, in terms of, of our expectations for, for value creation on Horn C3, it is, uh, uh, as, as we've talked about, that we do see that we, over time, would be able to progress the project uh, towards the guided range. Um, I, uh, on, on the other uh, projects uh, in our uh, awarded portfolio, so that would be um, uh, Horn C2, sorry, uh, Bolchka 2 and Bolchka 3. Um, on Bolchka 2, we see sufficient value creation. And that and Daniel has been very clear uh, throughout the day about what that means. Uh, and on uh, Baltica 3, uh, that is not the case, even though it is uh, life cycle positive uh, spread to WAC, it's, it's not good enough uh, for us right now, which is why we have taken a step back and reconfigured so that it can meet our uh, requirements to value. If, if you just, uh, if you took a look at the total portfolio that Daniel showed in Europe and APAC, that total portfolio is, is within our guided range, and we have both Horn C3 and the awarded portfolio within that. Correct. So that is included in the Europe and APAC portfolio, which is within the guided range. All right. I think we'll take one uh, question from uh, with the inbox. Um, and the question reads, how do you want to ensure the availability of enough offshore installation vessels for your plan? given the evidence shortage projected over the next years. Would you take that? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, we work in, in different methodologies. One is long-term agreement, which we have already in place for about uh, 10 gigawatt. We also do project specific because in some countries we have also EU tender to follow. But we are also in very active um, dialogue with several uh, suppliers on, on vessels for the remaining um, uh, capacity. Now, it is important to also um, see and understand that it's not only about what vessel, it's not only about uh, securing a vessel, we are also at the same time looking at what is the development of the technology. Because as we go towards the end of the decade in uh, larger turbines or foundations, then we might need a, a different mix of, uh, of vessels. So we are in active uh, dialogue with, um, with several vessel suppliers for, to further um, uh, secure the um, capacity. But I'm really confident with what we have already in the long term and also with the amount of vessels that is coming into the market uh, in the next four years. Then Togo uh, Carnegie, uh, a question on the 27 gigawatt you plan to have net to contribute to EBDA in 2030. How is that distributed among the, the assets? That's not a detail that we, uh, that we have in there, but the starting point is that we divest everything, farm down everything down to 50%. So you can basically take the, the gross capacity and then uh, subtract 50%. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the biomass-fired power plants are also in there, and, and, and we're not looking to, to farm down uh, those. So that's why you are a little bit higher than, than what would otherwise give you roughly uh, 25 gigawatts. And Daniel, maybe just one thing just for the benefit of the audience, the, those three near-term U.S. projects were in a JV in those projects already, and they're already 50% owned by Eversource, who's announced that they want to exit the JV, but someone else will step into that 50%. So. Hi, uh, David Paz from Wolf Research. Uh, just a question on David on the U.S. projects. You were asked about the bonus tax credits uh, assumed in the value neutral, but you also noted changes or continued progress on OREC terms. Are those are any assumed changes in that value creative? So in other words, do you need to have changes to those OREC terms to uh, maintain value neutral? Yeah, to reiter reiterate what I said uh, earlier, um, these projects have experienced a lot of turmoil between rising infl inflation, interest rates, and supply chain bottlenecks. So to get back to value neutral on a life cycle basis is, we think, very impressive. Um, but it does require certain assumptions. And we, we highlighted in the presentation that uh, we do need some adjustments to the OREX, uh, primarily the uh, request that we've made to the state of New York um, which again, we've been working with them for six, seven months and um, you know, feel confident that we'll get the support we need in order to make the, the adjustment to that uh, OREC. And likewise, um, we need to make sure that we get the full benefit of tax passback on our Ocean Wind One project, which again, we've been speaking with the state of New Jersey for a while and we expect resolution on that relatively shortly. So we have high confidence that these assumptions that we're taking will come true. And yes, that will take us to a life cycle neutral MPV on those projects. Thank you. It's, uh, it's Dominic Nash from Barclays. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, the question I've got is, uh, is a clarity one, please, on the 50 gigawatt target and the 475 billion CapEx program. Can you just confirm again that the 50 gigawatt target is gross of JVs and EVs, EPC partners, but a 475 billion CapEx is looking like it looks like it's net of the JV partners. Could you give us some sort of numbers as to what you think the um, net uh, gigawatts that you will be developing, developed by 2030 will be, and or also what the gross, gross CapEx number, I think in the last Capital Markets Day, I think it was a 450 to 350, and I think the 475 mm -hmm. is comparable with the 350, isn't it? Yeah. So, um uh, it, it's correct. So we don't have JV capex in there, and we don't have the capex that the 
partner contributes with after we've done a construction agreement uh, farm down. The way you should think about it is that when you look at the two buckets, uh, near-term uh, uh, awarded projects and the uh, uh, pre-2030 uh, 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 projects that is not in the near-term uh, portfolio, that we assume that we take roughly 60 to 70 percent on average of that capex. So you would have to add roughly 50 percent on top of those two uh, uh, numbers in order to come to a gross gross number that we in last capital markets day called the green investments. In order to simplify things, we, we, uh, we kept that out, uh, but it's, it's, it's roughly that magnitude. Thanks very much. It's uh, Jenny Ping from City. Um, I guess uh, just a follow on from that. Um, if I look at your onshore uh, and offshore capex numbers and uh, look at the gigawatts that you're looking to deploy on the back of that, the, the, the onshore numbers look incredibly high and the offshore numbers look incredibly low on a euro per megawatt basis. Is that just because of the gross net element or is that also because of uh, excluding cable costs and I net of ITC, et cetera. If you can clarify that, that would be great. Yeah. I think if you, if you did the, uh, the, the change that I talked about before, where you include the JV impact and the construction agreement capex part on the offshore, then you would get to a, 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 a more meaningful uh, multiple than just taking the numbers there and dividing it by the, the capacity uh, in there. And, uh, and on the onshore part, um, I don't know whether uh, you want to comment on it, but, but there is, of course, a, an element of, uh, of conservatism uh, in, our, in our numbers, um, but, but we think it's a, it's, it's a good level when you're considering the, the long-dated uh, uh, CapEx assumptions. Mike Becker from HSBC. Thank you for the presentation and taking my question. I have one on the new markets. You outlined your strategy and how you select the markets. Could you take Spain as an example to elaborate a little bit more in detail what you like about the market and how you think about it? Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, the reason uh, that, that we have decided to move into Spain recently are, are manifold. So we basically have applied uh, the framework that I, that I talked about before. That being said, we don't see Spain uh, as a core market. So we have these sort of five northern European core markets where we spend 80% of our DIVX. Spain is in the, is in the other pocket. Uh, the reason that we, that we are uh, happy being in Spain right now uh, is that we see a lot of potential uh, both on the onshore side, in particular on solar and storage, uh, but also on uh, floating. Uh, we, 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 we have the right partnership in place with Repsol, so we have the ability to shape. And on, especially on the, on the solar side, we, we see scale and we see uh, potential for speed uh, hopefully when we are on the other side of the upcoming Spanish election, that this is an area where we can see our pipeline of uh, 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 9 gigawatts of onshore uh, picking up uh, quite fast. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, a question on the US. Uh, US utilities are generally skeptical about uh, offshore wind and your current par partners are see seeking to sell their stake. Don't you think it might be challenging to find partners in future projects, for instance, if you wind uh, New York 3 or, or Rhode Island? David? Yes. Um, I think the, the decision to partner with US utilities was a wise one at the time. It was before I, I was at Orsted, but we were new in the US market. We wanted um, local incumbents that could help us with the, the ground game and the, the stakeholder engagement. At the time, the, the returns looked promising to these uh, utility investors. But over time, as the, as the projects got um, delayed in the Trump administration and started to experience challenges, 
we've, we realize that those partners, maybe as much as we all get along and we, and we, we like each other and we supported each other, it wasn't really the right business profile for them. They're used to regulated returns, primarily transmission regulated returns. And so now you see our US utility customers wanting to, to exit offshore wind. Both of them explicitly said that they're pro offshore wind and they want to support the offshore wind build out in the US, um, but they want to do the, trans, the onshore transmission upgrades needed to accept, onshore, uh, to accept offshore wind. And so it's just really more about business models and, and their you know, comfort with kind of an IPP business model versus a regulated return and a new technology. Likewise, I think in the meantime, we've built a very strong stakeholder engagement corporate affairs team. And so we have a ground game in, in New Jersey, in New York, in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, and of course in Washington, DC. And we think that we've built a very strong brand and very strong capability in that area. So we're confident that we can build these projects now without those JV partners. And as we think about who will step in um, to Eversource's position, for example, um, as a JV partner, we, we have looked through rights and we've been in coordination with them all the way through. So we know uh, which types of, of, of investors are, are looking at that, that position. Um, and we're comfortable that there will be um, a, a new buyer um, relatively soon. Likewise, now we own 100% of Ocean Wind One. Um, and again, at some point when it's appropriate, We'll probably do a farm down of, of that project. And again, we'll control who, who the investor will be. But we would have confidence that we could find an investor for that as well. All right. We'll take another uh, written question. This one is coming from Alberto Gandolfi from Goldman Sachs. <coughs> On a like-for-like -like basis, you are essentially targeting a project IRR over WAC of 200 to 400 basis points. You also said you want to be disciplined in future auction. Does that mean that for now we should think about more uh, mid to upper end of this range? No, I, I think it, what we are doing is we are firmly committing to that range. Uh, and depending on where we are, depending on the risk profile of this, and depending on the opportunity set, we will go no further in specifying uh, rather than it, that it is within that range, which we again commit very firmly to delivering in. That's as close as we can get it. For me and Morgado from Man Group, um, I guess it's a, it's a financial question, but with a three-part question. I mean, the way that I value an investment uh, first is the volatility of the top line or you know the earnings, and what I'm trying to assess is that how volatile is your top line. I mean, it seems to me that uh, you know what's the percentage of your revenue that is tied to PPAs and how sensitive these PPAs are to inflation or you know, whatever, you know, merchant power prices. I, if I may, I mean, the oil companies normally give a sensitivity to oil price 10% up and 10% down. What I'm trying to get is that if merchant prices move up 10% or down 10%, how much your revenue will be sensitive? The second part is, um, I mean, you show a very interesting chart of the OPEX coming down, right, you know, with scale. And and then you have this also uh, target of I think it's 13 to 14 percent EBITDA growth. So what I'm trying to assess is that how much of that um, that operational leverage is really tied it into this margin expansion that you can have in the future, because it wasn't wasn't clear to me that if these uh, um, 13 to 14 percent you know already tied in you know into your uh, potential of margin expansion. And the last part is, um, I mean, in terms of the, 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 the PPAs, you have these 55 um, corporate PPAs globally, right? What's the maturity of these PPAs and, you know, and your ability, you know, to, to sign more PPAs? You know, is it a question that can you sign much more or do you want to keep that 20%, you know, open to, um, uh, to, to, to merchant prices? And if I may, you know, on the farm downs, <laughs> is there no, any I way? I think we'll start with those. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's start uh, with those. We'll, yeah. we'll, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll be the last. And I please, promise. only one question. Yep. Uh, per, on, per. on the farm downs, I mean. No, 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 no. I think Sorry. I will try we'll, to we'll start with these, uh, these questions. So, so first of all, when it comes to our revenue and EBDA, eighty percent is coming from regulated and long-term contracted earnings, with an average lifetime of. 16 years. So we have a very strong foundation and visibility on that 80% of our earnings and the 
and, uh, and the revenue. Through that, you also get a, a sensitivity in the sense that we've said what the EBDA is in 2030, and then you will know roughly 20% of that is from merchant exposure, and roughly 80% of that is uh, uh, regulated and contracted earnings. And then you can then you can work with uh, work with the power prices. Um, a, a rough sensitivity is that on our offshore portfolio. If you lower merchant prices with 20%, it's, it's a little more than uh, a billion. And if you shift the power curve down 20% throughout that period, it is, uh, it is roughly one percentage point on, on, uh, on row C. On the OPEX question that you, uh, that you had, I think it's important to be aware of that when you look at the full uh, value of a, especially offshore wind part, optimizing and using synergies and scale on the OPEX is of course extremely important. And we have a lot of levers there that we are working with that is adding value but usually the uh, gross margin on an offshore wind farm is you know close to 80 percent so it's not uh, it's not the opex that's going to drive a lot of the ebda growth that we are looking into or optimizing that that is very much due to new assets uh, coming on stream uh, inflation adjustments uh, uh, working with the regulators um, um, yeah. Then on the corporate PPA part, um, as I said, roughly 16 years of average remaining lifetime uh, on that. And uh, again, it's an area where we are very active uh, in the market. I don't know, Rasmus, if you want to put a couple of comments on, on how we see the, the European market on, on, on corporate PPAs. I can, uh, absolutely. So, so um we have entered into uh, almost a gigawatt of corporate PPAs, and the PPAs we have in our portfolio are, um, remember that the starting point of them is typically when the wind farm comes on stream, so they, in this case, when it's a German wind farm, starts in 25. So when you talk about the maturity and the lifetime, that's your starting point. So when we, for instance, say that we have a 25-year corporate PPA with BASF, it starts in 25. Um, and you see a maturity on all of our European offshore wind copper PPAs of more than 10 years. Uh, and uh, we uh, seek to ensure uh, also, uh, back to what Daniel has been talking about, that going forward they are all uh, uh, indexed and also they are all uh, as produced. And we see, final comment, uh, increasingly strong demand in that market. Mm. And we see prices coming up relatively dramatically. Frank from Cardano. Uh, I only have one question. <laughs> 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 On inflation index revenue, uh, you mentioned that in the US and Taiwan contracts, they are uh, fixed nominal. Do you see any potentials for them to be inflation indexed? I think I think we can say that that the uh, I mean the, the retrospective inflation indexing that we are looking at for 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 Sunrise specifically that we put in a position is essentially neutralizing what has happened and that will give us a meaningful uplift in in that uh, in in the auric price that we have gotten. But apart from that, getting in, getting back now and renegotiating generally on these uh, projects, I would say that the that the likelihood of, of that, apart from what we have done, would probably be relatively slim. But bear in mind that, uh, for example, in Taiwan, the, 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 the headroom that we had in our business case, that even after the inflationary impact, which, by the way, has been smaller in Taiwan, then we are still seeing a, a, a very meaningful uh, value creation there. So, so, so these are, we're saying the US projects is again, sorry, David, but that is again where we see in the main, the main challenge is that is where on the sunrise, which is, we, we, which is that, that's where we have the best chances of getting that, uh, that, that inflation indexing retrospectively. But also bear in mind that we have other regulatory levers which would help those business cases, especially the IRA benefit pass back. 
And it's clear to all customers, both uh, states, governments, and, and corporates, that the developers want more inflation protection. Mean, and that's why we've also seen the changes in Poland, in Rhode Island, New York, and, and also the upcoming Massachusetts auction. Uh, yes, um, good afternoon. Vincent Aero from uh, JP Morgan. Uh, thank you uh, for this very good presentation. And actually, there were very good questions, actually, from my colleagues before. So I'll, I'll go to uh, a follow-up on uh, the previous uh, multi-step question. But uh, don't worry, it's just on the commodity exposure here. Um, I, I think I heard during the presentation that you assumed par price reset by about 20%. Somewhere in your guidance. Uh, I'd like to understand how that works out with the power market reform we have in, in, in Europe in general. Uh, so we got it in Europe, we're likely to get it in UK as well over the timeline uh, to 2030. So what are you assuming uh, regarding this uh, power market reform? How do you see it coming, you know, level and timeline? Uh, any color on this would be extremely appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, so I think on, on, on the power price uh, assumptions, what, what, what we do is that we use uh, forwards in the front uh, uh, usually two to five years in our, in our modeling, and then we move to a fundamental uh, in-house model. And we are assuming decreasing uh, power prices throughout the period. Power price is going down with roughly 40% as of today until 2027 and then a further 20% down from 27 to, uh, to, to 2030. On the any, power... On power any comments on the power market reform? Yeah, I can add uh, a little bit. Uh, so um, the basic assumption is that the marginal uh, pricing model that we currently have in Europe will continue uh, to exist. So, so that's an underlying assumption uh, which we are uh, quite confident uh, about. And then, uh, obviously, also on the very short term, we see uh, this month that also uh, governments around Europe are looking into whether or not to prolong the cap, uh, where, where we also, uh, there are a few exceptions, but, but overall, we also see, uh, due to the easing of, of the power price spike, that we see uh, uh, the caps being uh, released. But fundamentally, for the long term, we uh, assume uh, that marginal pricing will continue to exist. Hello, it's Mark Freshney from Credit Suisse, and I apologize in advance, David, for coming back to your three problem children and also asking you mean questions. But on timeline uh, for the US, the three, you know, Sunrise, Ocean Winds, and Revolution, um, when can we expect the BOEM consents? When can we expect the discussions with the IRS to complete? And when can we expect uh, with the PSC to, to get agreement on the OREX, et cetera. Um, because you, you've spoken a lot about returns and you've given a lot of information there. But just in terms of timeline, that's, that's arguably the bit that, that we don't have. Yeah, I don't think it's a hard question. So uh, th th thanks for asking. Um, really, um, our expectation is that we will be able to meet all the requirements for the boundary conditions for FID by the end of this year for all three projects. They're, they'll be staggered a little bit. Uh, ideally, Ocean Wind 1 first, and then Revolution, and then Sunrise, hopefully FID by the end of the year. That, that kind of tracks the, the permitting milestones, the federal permitting milestones, which are public. You can go find them on the, on the BOEM dashboard. But we expect our permits, our final federal permits uh, for those three projects to, to all come later this year. Um, on the resolution of some of the assumptions. So I, it's my expectation that we should be able to have some resolution with the state of New Jersey relatively soon. I would maybe hedge and say you know, this summer, but could be, could be faster than that. Um, on the resolution with the state uh, of New York, it's our expectation that, that, this, that if we follow their kind of regulatory process, we should have uh, feedback from them by October, it could be delayed, but the fastest we could have feedback from them through the through the PSC um, is, is is in early October, and that will align with our FID on Sunrise, so we'll know the answer on that. And then likewise on final 
guidance from the IRS, it's our expectation that that would be probably late summer Q3 as well. So we're trying to line up these FIDs with the permitting milestones and other boundary conditions along with the shoring up of the, of the business cases. And that's how we see this playing out over the next, um, next half of the year. And, and maybe just to add w one thing, as you call it, the, the, the problem child, and of course something that we are working very hard for. But you know, taking a top-down portfolio view on this, these US projects account for a little more than 10% of the investment plan that we have. So it's of course important that we work to further optimize the value creation in those projects, but on a portfolio level, you know, it's, it's around 10%. They're my babies. They're not my problem children. I love them all. Uh, Richard Alderman, BTIG. Um, just following on from Jenny's question earlier and your answer to that um, in terms of the conservative nature of your assumptions on CapEx per megawatt for onshore, and also Vincent's question just now. What do you, if you're assuming power prices are falling progressively in Europe and elsewhere through the decade, what are your assumptions on ASPs for turbines, particularly in the next one to two years? Where do you see the peak in that process as the first one? And then um, just listening to your answer on sort of, I appreciate we're in a high inflation environment and at the moment you're turning on significant offshore um, capacity. So by, clearly that does drive your EBITDA margin depending on what your power price assumptions are on costs, et cetera. But if I take you back to the capital markets day when we were last in Copenhagen two occurrences ago, um, one of the interesting things you said then was that you plan to take quite a significant proportion of your third party O&M contracts with the turbine manufacturers back in house. Do you still plan to do that? Because as we go into that lower capex, sorry, lower power price environment, that would make a meaningful difference if you were describing what you're saying at the moment in terms of your cost savings are as good, if not better, in terms of running a 15 megawatt turbine as opposed to a six megawatt turbine. I think we, I don't know if we can answer specifically on the assumptions for ASP, but maybe on, the, on how we work with the forward-looking outlook on, on, uh, on inflation. So the average selling price would, uh, would, maybe if you could give some comments to that and you could comment on, the, on taking the contracts in, uh, Richard. I don't know if I understood the question completely, um, because you were also referring of, of us taking the ownership of the uh, of the turbine. So maybe can you? No, I think it's the average selling price of the onshore yes. turbines. Yes. We see the development going forward. Yes. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an assumption uh, that uh, we should give. No, no, not specifically. But maybe I was maybe what we could do, Virginie, is to give a perspective on how we work with a forward-looking view on, on the pricing and the capex inflation, so how we oh, yeah. do that. Yes, if yes. you could give a general comment on that. Yeah, no, I mean, in generally, we have a, a, a costing model, um, which is a model that not only look at the cost of the capex, but all the data that we have gathered over the years, and then also coming in the technical data that our engineers are giving, on the uh, average uh, energy production of a, of a turbine. And then, so, so that is in fact all in our model. And then we can, through that model, really look, uh, and we normally look about um, eight years to 10 years uh, ahead. So it is quite a complex in-house model based on cost, technology, uh, data of the field, and, and the information that our engineers work very closely with with our suppliers. Yeah, and, and coming up to the, the taking in-house of the operations, I think as we've, we've highlighted here, we've continued to do that. Um, and uh, we see that that has been adding value to us. I mean, going forward, the key thing is that we operate uh, in the correct manner, the overall wind farm. Um, we're not against, we're, if the suppliers are able to de deliver competitive offerings around the turbine itself, then in the right circumstances, we might take them as the maintainer of a turbine. Uh, but it is, again, a value question. But the overall flexibility of how we operate at the moment and the level of maturity in the OEMs at the moment in the offshore space means that we're still getting good value out of doing the whole thing ourselves. But I'm sure that they will continue to mature their offering and come with interesting concepts that we would, of course, consider uh, going forward for the actual turbines themselves.
Lars Eindhoven from Nordea. Uh, question regarding farm downs and the rosy target of 14%. If I try to back out uh, the historical farm downs, uh, get to an average rosy around 8-9%, uh, and now you say that you expect uh, around about 20 uh, billion on a yearly basis going forward. So just want to hear your view on what kind of rosy X farm downs, which are by nature a bit lumpy and unpredictable, you're expecting. So it's it's not a, a number I have for you, and I'll, we can of course come back to some consideration on, on, on that. I think what's important to be aware of is that um, we are assuming that the gain part will of course be lower in the future as many of the historical farm downs were based on you know much higher CFD levels, much higher IRR levels. So, so the level of, of gains in ROSI is uh, relatively going down as we move into our 150 to 300 basis points uh, uh, range. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Right here and here. Thanks again. Uh, Jenny Ping from City again. Um, just going back to the farm down number, the 150 billion um, DKK, w w I was intrigued in the presentation you talk about um, selective more than 50% farm down. So, so what does that assume in that 150? Does it assume straightforward 50-50 or are you assuming further than 50%? Thanks. There is a... Uh there is a, an element of taking an opportunistic approach to farm downs uh, and JVs that means that on some of our assets we could potentially see ownership going uh, uh, below the 50%. Uh, in less established markets or for example in, uh, in P2X. Uh, so in P2X we, we are assuming a, a minority a share, meaning that uh, here we will, for some of them, go below 50%, and some we will uh, be at, uh, at, at, at roughly uh, uh, 50%. All right, and uh, one final question. Uh, I have a question for Olivia. Um, in the BEX industry, what everybody wants to know is what you can say about the pricing on the, the contract you have with Microsoft for the negative emissions. What what can you say on the pricing regarding that? Not much, Mark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, other than it's good. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, I'll, I'll say that that uh, we, we cannot go into the specific pricing, but but it is that contract that enabled us to give the winning bit to the Danish uh, to the Danish Energy Agency and win that 430 tons a year. So that unfortunately is as close as we can get it. All right. On that note, we will uh, end the Q&A, and I will uh, hand over the word to Mass for final words, and then afterwards, invite all of you to join us for, for lunch and networking downstairs. Yes, and I won't take more of your time. Uh, essentially, we are already a little bit over time. So uh, a big thank you to all of you for prioritizing to be with us, and an even bigger thank you for your trust in our company. We are fully convinced and fully committed to delivering on the path that we have laid out today. Uh, and I can say uh, I feel privileged to have the best possible team behind me to do just that. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your trust. And we look forward to the continued dialogues over the coming days, weeks, and months. Thank you.